hear from the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, to talk about uh, what his government is doing to contain the pandemic from a public health perspective and from an economic one. That decision by the Governor of the Bank of Canada, Stephen Polaz, this morning, slashing that rate before it was expected, but also to the lowest rate uh, that we have seen since the recession back in 2008-2009. So a significant move by the governor there to try and uh, shore up the fundamentals of the economy and make sure that there's enough lending power. Let me show you a little bit of what the governor of the Bank of Canada had to say just a few moments ago. Some may suggest that this is uh, using a lot of a lot of firepower, but I think that um, you know, uh, a, a firefighter has never been criticized for using too much water. And I think, if you like, that's, that's where we want to make sure of it, uh, that we've got great market function, and indeed that the economy then has a great foundation for uh, growth uh, when uh, activity resumes. Uh, this country, as well as countries around the world, trying to fight COVID-19 on a number of fronts. As I mentioned, the health front, obviously, first and foremost, concern for many people, but also the real economic impact this is having and will be expected to have over the next number of months. The governor telling Canadians that in many ways we've been hit twice because of the pandemic, but also because of the steep drop in oil prices in this country. So we're dealing with really two crises at the same time. Let's bring in the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas, and the CBC's David Cochran joins me as well today. Um, so that, that rate, rate cut, uh, I don't think we were expo supposed to see anything from them for another couple of weeks, but they did this obviously because they felt that there was A, more room to do it, uh, but B, also because it was necessary. And it comes as the parliamentary budget officer has given us a bit of a snapshot um, on, on what the economy might look like over uh, the next six months. I should stress that this isn't an outlook, a financial outlook. It's a scenario that they have come up with uh, based on the kinds of things that they're seeing now. Not sure who wants to weigh in on that first. Vashi? Yeah, sure. I'll just, uh, I think, I mean, the scenario is not an unsurprising one. I think even they're, they're sort of forecasting based on that scenario. And they're very careful, as you mentioned, Rosie, to say the parliamentary budget officer, that's sort of the watchdog here in parliament for uh, budgets that take place from the, that, that generate from the government. Uh, they're careful to say this is just us making an assumption and then basing our forecast on that assumption. And the mm -hmm. assumption that they make is that these measures stay in place right through the summer. And so physical distancing, businesses, non-essential businesses closed. Imagine all of this, the way we live right now, stays in place for a number of more months. Well, it will have a massively detrimental effect on the economy. I think everybody knows that by this time. And the way that they look at it is, uh, you know, a contraction now, but an even bigger one in the quarter that follows. I think a 25% contraction yeah. in GDP yeah. at that point. That's huge. Uh, levels that, for example, we haven't seen since the early uh, 90s. And then in some cases, depending on what it means for the budget, which would be, you know, an a, a obviously much bigger deficit, um, numbers that we haven't seen since the 80s as well. So we're, we're, lo we're in a very, his you know, this is historical. It is extraordinary. We've said that over and over again. It will have an impact on the government's bottom line, and it will also have an impact on the economy, more largely speaking. That's clear. I think, I think it's, you know, you have to take it all with a grain of salt because it is, we just, it's diff very difficult to model. It's very difficult to predict. I think what we can expect from the Prime Minister today is addressing a key segment of the economy that we have been asking about for days. And he has said more information, more help is coming in the coming days. And that is the, uh, the small business sector. So small business owners, I'm told, will be the focus of the, today's announcement. Uh, the message will be keep people on the payroll. I don't know what specifically that means as far as what they're going to promise. But I think for me, that particularly raises the question around wage subsidies. We've talked about it often over the past week. Will they increase the subsidy from 10% to a much higher number like other jurisdictions in Europe have done in order to um, sort of uh, promote the idea that employers should keep employees on the payroll? That is, that is what I'm looking for today. And small and medium-sized businesses, and we've been hearing a lot from them saying that that 10% wage subsidy was yeah. just not going to be enough. Uh, just to give people an idea of, of who we're dealing with, this is really the largest sort of private uh, sector employer in the country. There are almost a million, more than a million small and medium-sized businesses in Canada. More than half of them have fewer than four employees. So this is a, a, a key part of the economy, and many, many businesses are concerned about having to shutter briefly and then just not having the ability to reopen. Uh, David, not sure which part you want to weigh in there, but over to you. Well, yeah, there's a bunch of things. I'll start yeah. with the PBO, then the Bank of Canada, then small business, if I can. The PBO estimate is actually quite stark and, and 
quite frankly, I thought it was a little bit optimistic, even though the numbers are what they are. A 25% GDP contraction in the next quarter, 5% down overall, a 15% unemployment rate over the mm -hmm. course of the year, assuming the physical distancing and the restrictions we have in place last until August, and a federal deficit of around $113 billion, up from $26 billion, which was the projection. Um, that's probably going to grow because there's more spending measures going to come on top of that. The Bank of Canada rate cut is interesting. It's about as low as it really can go. Money is essentially free right now. And Stephen Polas, <laughs> the governor of the Bank of Canada, said he's not going to lower it anymore. This is as low as they're going to go. A very interesting part of his announcement today, Rosie, is that they're going to get into quantitative easing, which essentially means they're going to start buying government bonds to increase the money supply in the economy and put cash into the big financial institutions so that there's lending capacity. And they're going to spend $5 billion a week, every week, until we are into recovery. Just think about that. Mm -hmm. That's $5 billion mm -hmm. a week with an undetermined endpoint uh, of bond buying uh, to put money into the financial institutions and into the economy to keep things going. And the clip we play from Pola is that a firefighter never gets criticized for using too much water. Well, this is like Noah's Ark level of water that he's <laughs> pouring into the economy. Because if there's a button to press, they're going to press it. And, and you talk about the small and medium-sized businesses, which are going to be the focus of this today. Most Canadians work for a small or medium-sized company. Yep. These are sort of the backbone, not just of the economy, but of your communities and neighborhoods, right? Your main streets and your small corner stores and your community businesses. And we've seen some very dire predictions from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business throughout all of this that without a massive increase in direct government support, one third of small businesses don't think they're going to make it a month. Yeah. They might have their rent and their bills for April 1. They definitely don't have it for May 1. And so the 10% wage subsidy for three months that was part of the initial response that was announced, that's what they've been targeting. They're looking at other countries like in Europe where you get 75 to 80% of the wage subsidy. The money goes into the businesses and goes straight to the employee um, as a model that they would like to see Canada adopt here. No idea if they're going to go that high, if they're going to move partway to that, or if this is even what they're considering today. But there has been acute pressure from, from a core element of the economy that that is really under acute stress at this point in time and and small businesses uh, you know have difficulty uh, surviving in in the best of times again statistics Canada says that most businesses are lucky to get past sort of their fifth year that about half of them fail at that point so any sort of uncertainty that that might come into the economy as we're seeing now would uh, would add to the, those risks um, just so people are watching there you are now familiar with the prime minister's front door um, that is Rito Cottage. We're expecting to hear from him in about uh, seven minutes time or so. Just want to make one note on um, something that you may have clicked in your ear a little bit there from Vashi and David, and you'll hear from me as well. And that's this language. Uh, we had been saying social distancing. We're now actually saying physical distancing. And we'll try and say that uh, consistently going forward as a bid to really um, better describe what public health officials are asking you to do, which is you, you can be very social uh, on the phone, on video chats um, on social media but physically you should be distancing yourself from one another is is the advice and it's key advice right now so we are trying to be more precise in our language to better reflect that advice as well let me bring in our senior business correspondent Peter Armstrong he's tracking this news as well so I'm sure you heard a little bit of what we were saying there Peter how do you uh, view this move by the Bank of Canada today this is a remarkable thing to the interest rate's one thing. The quantitative easing is is the big news here. And th this is, it is part of a coordinated global effort to prop up and, and to basically, Rosie, build scaffolding around the global financial infrastructure that somebody wrote really early on in the midst of this, that, that credit markets, so basically the, the short-term loaning, the access to credit that, that big banks and big financial institutions have, those credit markets are, are key to, to just the flow of, of of how capital and how those big institutions work and survive. Uh, and somebody wrote really early on saying that having functioning credit markets isn't gonna solve the problem. It's a health problem. It's gotta get sorted out by, by science and by, by doctors. But once they come up with a solution and they wanna get the economy back up and running, you have to have functioning credit markets. And without it, none of it's going to work. You're not gonna be able to, to get the money you need to get the right vaccines and, and, and borrow the money that's out there to, to get the economy back up and running. And so that's what's happening here. But this is, it's an extraordinary thing. I mean, quantitative easing unto itself is a bizarre and strange thing. Yes, it's basically yeah. making money out of thin air and injecting it into the economy. And we're looking at now doing $5 billion 
dollars a week until the economic recovery is quote well underway. So the foreseeable future, uh, it, it is it's an extraordinary thing. Yeah, and I mean, the PBO today looking at a, about a six-month range of these measures right. being in place. I mean, we don't, we obviously don't really know, but that seems like a, a, a decent estimate. Um, let me get you to weigh in on the small and medium-sized businesses here, as Vashi and David have done. Uh, there was a, a fair amount of outcry from them that the 10% wage subsidy was not going to be enough to keep them afloat. What have you been hearing, or what would you think that the government might move towards? There are two things that I keep hearing from small businesses, and this is from fairly big businesses that import a ton of clothing and, and, and employ hundreds of people, all the way down to you know the local gymnastics gym and his rent. Uh, most small businesses, most medium-sized businesses don't own the properties or own the storefronts that they're operating out of, uh, and, and they're not getting a break on rent, and that's outside of their employees, that's always the biggest expense. And so getting a break on rent is going to be enormously important. The other one that I, I spoke with a, a clothing man or a clothing importer uh, who sells clothes across the country was saying he has to pay all these duties. So he's paid for product that is coming in from whatever country. It's coming here. He now knows he's not going to be able to sell it. And even if he has sell it, he's not going to, people aren't going to be paying their bills right away because they're, they're, they're dealing with this crisis instead. He's okay with that, but he still has to pay $130,000 a month in import duties to the Canadian government. And he's looking for relief around that. And I think that's actually a fairly simple thing. But again, it's not the kind of thing that jumps out at you when you're trying to figure out what is a policy response to a crisis like this. There's probably not a bunch of people in the room going, oh, wait a second, what are we gonna do about import duties? Because it, sure. it, yeah. it is secondary, but it does matter. And it is going to be a matter of, of surviving or not for a lot of businesses. Okay, CBC senior business correspondent, Peter Armstrong, working remotely. Thanks for weighing in, appreciate it. We'll come back to you after. Before the prime minister comes out, I'm gonna try and sneak in this one interview. Heather Kennedy's mother is at Villa Marconi Care Home, and she can't see her right now because the care home is closed to outside visitors. There you can see Heather to protect the residents inside. I know a lot of you are dealing with that in this country. Heather was on uh, the local radio show here in Ottawa, Ottawa Morning with uh, Robin Bresnahan earlier. So we've, we were so compelled by that interview, Heather, that we wanted to talk to you here uh, on the special. How is your mom doing after two weeks of being isolated in her room and not being able to see you? Uh, well, I do see that she, it is wearing on her. I can see that uh, today I did have a call with her at 10 o'clock and she she looked really tired, she looked exhausted. And I, I asked her uh, how she was feeling and she said that she was uh, tired. Um, and she was tossing and turning last night. So she probably was wakeful last night and sometimes her nap might be too long. You know, her sleeping would be off. So that seems to be what happened. Uh, she She's she's 92. I know you're you're standing just outside her window there. Does is she aware of everything that's going on and and why you're not able to come in? And yes, she is. Uh, you know, a couple of days ago, I asked her, "Do you know what's going on?" And she said, "Yes, COVID 19." <laughs> so she is aware. Uh, my mother is a nurse, so she's, uh, she's familiar with an, uh, the healthcare setting and and these sorts of uh, things that happen. You know what. What have you been doing to try and lift her spirits other than standing outside the window there and waving hello? Yeah, well, um, we do go and see her every day and we kind of, Julian, uh, my husband, dances around and stuff and she, we got a couple of chuckles out of her. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we're kind of keeping her up to date on the family. She sang happy birthday for my daughter the other day. We had a, a group chat on uh, the FaceTime, I guess, the other night to have get a birthday party for my daughter from different parts of the country. You know, the family got together. And, uh, uh, she had, we had done a video with my mom singing happy birthday to her. So I'm, I'm just waiting for the Prime Minister, Heather, but let, let me end on this. How, how um, what would you say to other Canadians? Because so many people are dealing with this, not able to go and see their loved ones in long-term care centres because those are really vulnerable centres. What would you say to other Canadians? I would say to uh, be persistent and deal with the, uh, the uh, staff and the administrator and whoever you can in order to get in touch with your parents. And and to do it on a daily basis because they need our, uh, we're their lifeline. They need our, that contact every day. Um, I, I mean, I know that. I see caregivers that haven't been able to make it. We've been in touch with some of them. 
and uh, you know they're at a loss not being able to see their parents every day and for me this gives me uh, peace of mind and it also gives my mom peace of mind to see our faces every day right we were the the continuous uh, factor in the home every single day uh, and, and also because I'm her daughter but uh, <laughs> I was consistent and yep. uh, you know try and get that contact with your parent because it, okay. it does okay. help all around yeah. Heather, the Prime Minister's coming. Why don't you say hi to your mom for us? Thank you, and hang in there. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Rosie. Thank you. That's Heather Kennedy in Ottawa. Here's the Prime Minister of Canada. Taken by the Bank of Canada this morning. Monetary policy is very important. But as the governor of the bank has repeatedly said, the most important thing we can do to help people and the economy in this crisis is for the government to take strong fiscal action. So today... I want to speak directly to small businesses and entrepreneurs. I know that for many of you, the past few weeks have been heartbreaking. You've had to slow down your operations. In some cases, you've even had to close up shop for the foreseeable future. And because money isn't coming in, you can't afford to keep your employees on the payroll. These are really tough decisions. Tough because you don't want to let the people go who help you run your company in their time of need. Tough because some of you have built your business over the course of many years, if not decades. And now it seems like this climate of uncertainty could threaten everything you've worked for. I know many Canadians across the country are saddened to see their favorite neighborhood spots closed. These are the places that make our communities feel like home. Our government knows you're really feeling the impacts of this pandemic especially with the end of the month coming up. So here's what we're going to do to take some of that pressure off. Last week, we had announced that we would cover 10% of wages, but it's becoming clear that we need to do more, much more. So we're bringing that percentage up to 75% for qualifying businesses. This means that people will continue to be paid even though their employer has had to slow down or stop its operations because of COVID-19. We're helping companies keep people on the payroll so that workers are supported and the economy is positioned to recover from this. That is our priority. We will have more to say on this very soon, but I can tell you that this subsidy for small and medium-sized businesses will be backdated to Sunday, March 15th. For people who've lost their job or are self-employed, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit will still be there to help you. We also know that for small storefront businesses, they're struggling with cash flow right now. It's hard to raise money and make money in this climate. So to help you bridge to better times, we are launching the Canada Emergency Business Account. With this new measure, Banks will soon offer $40,000 loans, which will be guaranteed by the government to qualifying businesses. The loan will be interest-free for the first year, and if you meet certain conditions, $10,000 of it will be forgivable. Our government will also provide an additional $12.5 billion through Export Development Canada and the Business Development Bank to help small and medium-sized businesses with their operational cash flow requirements. This means that businesses will be able to apply for a guaranteed loan when they go to their financial institutions to get help as they weather the impacts of COVID-19. Lastly, we're announcing that we will defer GST and HST payments, as well as duties and taxes owed on imports until June. This is the equivalent of giving $30 billion in interest-free loans to businesses. So if you're struggling to get by right now and you have a payment due at the end of the quarter, we're going to give you more time. It will also allow you to keep the money that you would have been sent to the government and use it instead for your immediate needs. With these new measures, our hope is that employers who are being pushed towards laying off people because of COVID-19 will think again. And for those of you who've already had to lay off workers, we hope you will consider rehiring them given this payroll support. Over the coming days, we will announce additional measures to help the most vulnerable, youth, 
marginalized people, people who live in poverty. We're going to have more news to share with you very soon. Ce matin, this morning, I want to speak directly to entrepreneurs and small business owners. I know that in the last few weeks, you have been forced to make very difficult decisions. Some cannot pay their employees. Others had to shut down shop. This pandemic has destabilized the global economy, and the climate of uncertainty we see now is of great concern to you. Last week, our government announced a series of measures to help you, but you told us that you needed more, and we heard you. So today, we are announcing additional measures to assist you. Last week, we announced that we would provide a 10 percent wage subsidy, but it's clear that we must go further. So the percentage will now go up to 75 percent for qualifying SMEs. That means that employees will continue to be paid even if the business they work for has slowed down or has had to stop its activities altogether because of COVID-19. We are helping employers to keep their employees and support those employees and position the economy to recover. That is our priority. We will have more details on that very soon. But for the time being, I want you to know that this subsidy will be retroactive to March 15th. And for those who have lost their jobs or who are self-employed, the new Canada Emergency Benefit will be there for you. We also know that small businesses have problems with their cash flow right now. It's difficult to get financing in the current climate. So to help you to come through this tough time, we are creating the Canada Emergency Business Account. Through this new measure, banks will soon be offering loans of $40,000 guaranteed by the government to qualifying businesses. The loan will be interest-free for the first year, and if you meet certain conditions, the first $10,000 of that amount will be forgivable. Our government will also be providing $12.5 billion in additional uh, support to Export Development Canada and the Bank, the Development Bank of Canada to help SMEs with their cash flow requirements. Therefore, businesses can apply for a guaranteed loan through a financial institution in order to be able to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. And finally, our government is also announcing that people will have until June to make their payments of GST and HST, as well as to pay duties and taxes on imports. That is the equivalent of providing $30 billion in loans interest-free to businesses. So if you're having trouble meeting, making ends meet because of the pandemic, and you need more time, you will now have more time to make those payments. This will also allow you to keep more money to pay for your daily expenses. We hope that these measures will encourage employers who may have been felt forced to lay off their employees to keep them on payroll. And we also hope that if you have already done that, that you will think about rehiring those employees because of this wage subsidy. In the coming days, we will be announcing additional measures uh, to support uh, the most vulnerable Canadians, young people, marginalized Canadians, people live in, who live in poverty, and we will have news for you on that very soon. I know the past weeks have been really tough. You're worried about what COVID-19 means for your business and for your future. These are uncertain times, but my message to you today is we're going to be here for you. Small and medium-sized businesses are the backbone of our economy. You are collectively the largest employer in the country. You support millions of families. You serve our communities. And you make our towns and cities better places to live. Canadians are counting on you, and I am counting on you, to come back strong from this no matter what comes next. You're going to get the support you need to help rebuild a more resilient and prosperous economy. So to businesses across the country, 
please keep your workers on the payroll or think of hiring them back. In the meantime, let's keep listening to our public health officials. Let's wash our hands, stay home as much as possible, and keep a safe distance from each other when we go for a walk or when we have to go to the grocery store. Together, I know we're going to get through this. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier ministre. On va maintenant passer à la période des questions. On va commencer au téléphone avec une question avec un court suivi. Modérateur, c'est à vous. Thank you. Merci. The first question from Theresa Wright, the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Good morning, Prime Minister. Uh, could you please tell me when you expect the Americans to decide how they will or will not deploy their military in order to assist their border patrol? As I've said, uh, Canada and the United States benefit immensely from the fact that we share the longest unmilitarized border in the world. Uh, we have uh, expressed to the United States uh, that uh, it would be uh, a mistake uh, to position uh, troops uh, near the Canadian border, and we certainly hope uh, that they're not going to go through with that. You, uh, has the government received formal confirmation that the U.S. will not post troops on the border with Canada, or is this still a possibility? Uh, we continue to engage closely in back and forth uh, with uh, the American administration on many, many issues around the border, uh, and when we have uh, more information, we'll share it. Uh, both Canadians and Americans have a great benefit in the fact that we share the longest demilitarized border in the world, and it is in our interests to continue to have that. That is exactly what we have expressed to the U.S. administration, and this is what we continue to work on. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question, Émilie Bergeron, Agence QMI. À vous la parole. Oui, bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau. Good morning, euh, Mr. Trudeau. Sur, euh, la PCU. Could you let us know whether some of these amounts will be taxable? And I'd also like to know what more your government can do to help the media during this crisis. We recently uh, saw that they were in difficulty. The Canadian Emergency Response Benefit will be an income replacement measure like employment insurance and like EI, it will be taxable. However, we will not be taking money off at source, so people will receive the entire amount immediately. And because we have a progressive tax system, we will be able to ensure that the people who need it most will benefit from it at the very as much as possible. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Alex Ballengal from the Toronto Star. Your line is open. Good morning, Prime Minister. Um, just with these new measures that you're announcing, can you give us a sense of the cost? And I'd also like to know, given that uh, the budget was originally scheduled for, for next Monday, I believe, when we're going to see uh, an, uh, like a fiscal accounting of all these spending measures in a, in a fiscal update or a budget? Um We've uh, announced today that we will be uh, supporting small and medium-sized businesses uh, with uh, payroll support up to 75 percent uh, for qualifying businesses. Uh, we know uh, that this is going to be a significant measure of investing in Canadians and in businesses so that we can bounce back from, uh, from the difficult times we're going through right now, in, both on the health side and on the economic side. Uh, we recognize that these are unprecedented investments in the economy, uh, but we also know that they are necessary. They are necessary because we have to get through these coming months of uh, restricted uh, economic activity uh, where people stay at home uh, and uh, work from home or don't go to work as much as possible focusing on keeping their families safe. But if we can support businesses to keep that relationship with their employees, to keep uh, being able to pay their employees through this time, we know that coming out of this crisis uh, will be smoother and better uh, than otherwise. That is our focus right now. 
uh, in terms of uh, accounting, in terms of accountability, uh, we will, of course, uh, as uh, was passed in Parliament earlier this week, uh, be uh, engaging regularly with members of the opposition, uh, with the Finance Committee, and ensuring that uh, people are seeing uh, exactly what we're doing. We know that transparency around the investments we're making to support Canadians is important, not just from a democratic and parliamentary principle, but it's also important in terms of giving confidence in Canadians that this government will be there for them while they do what is necessary to keep themselves, their families, their neighbours safe and ensure that we can come out of this stronger than ever before. Merci. Dernière question avec un court suivi. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question, Michel Lamarche, TVA Nouvelle. À vous la parole. Mr. Trudeau, j'aimerais vous Mr. entendre. Mr. Trudeau, au sujet I'd de like to hear more about today's que vous announcement. Êtes en mesure de dire Are you in a position to tell us how many SMEs could be helped by this and how many employees? Uh, uh, on est en train, and also how much it will cost. Well, right now we are finalizing uh, the details and we expect to be lundi. able to uh, provide all that information by Monday. But I can assure you that uh, whatever initiatives we need to take for PMEs will really help them to keep their employees on payroll, uh, to continue to pay them, uh, even though there's very little work to be done. So, for example, a family restaurant that's been in place for many, many years and has had the same employees for many, many years and have been with them through the good times and the bad times. And now, in the midst of this crisis, they find themselves unable to continue to pay those employees when they need the money most. So we need to be there for them. And yes, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit will help a great many people who need it. But when possible, it is better for everyone that we keep that connection between employers and employees so that people can know that they will still have a job even though they're not working and that they'll be able to go back to that job. But especially, we will all be able to come out of this crisis quickly when the time comes. We need people to feel reassured that the economy will recover and that not only can we keep ourselves safe, but we can also get things back to normal and continue to have an extraordinary country right here in Canada. And that's what we're going to be doing. Now, with respect to the cost, of course, that will depend on the decisions we make with respect to the design of the program, but we can tell you that we will do whatever is necessary to help businesses affected by COVID-19. We recognize that uh, there's uh, still a little more design work to be done on this, and we will have uh, more on all the details, hopefully by Monday, so people can make those decisions to keep people on the payroll, to even uh, rehire people to be back on the payroll. Because we're thinking about that family-owned restaurant has been around for years, had many of the same employees for years, employees who've been there through slowdowns, good times and bad times. And now in this moment of crisis, they're having to lay these people off at their time of need. We know that allowing people to continue that relationship, allow people to continue to feel and to know they have a job, and allow employers to keep supporting those families uh, who work with them is a really important thing, not just for people's confidence, but for the uh, ability of all of us to bounce back strongly from this once we're through it. We need people to be focusing on taking care of themselves and their families and not worrying about what the future will bring. There's plenty of worry for right now in terms of keeping safe. That's why we are focused on being there for you. With the three measures that we're announcing uh, today, with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, with uh, the payroll support up to 75%, and the significant access to credit for businesses that are squeezed, we are demonstrating that we are there for you to help us through this moment so we can come back once we're all safer stronger than ever before. 
M. Trudeau en suivi, j'aimerais vous entendre sur le scénario du directeur parlementaire du budget. Could you comment on the PBO's scenario that there would be a $7 billion deficit in 2021, and that's not counting all the measures announced previously and announced today. What do you say to Canadians who see the deficit exploding and may be very worried about that? Canada was in a very good fiscal position before this. We had the best economic and fiscal position of any country in the world with a GDP to debt to ratio that's very, very low and which is exactly what allows us to take the necessary measures now, feeling fully confident of our ability to help people in this emergency. This is a completely unprecedented situation that requires that we invest to help people, to help small businesses, to help employers, and particularly to help uh, workers and their families. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are confident about Canada's ability to survive, and we know that if we can come through this, this difficult period by remaining healthy and doing what we need to do to protect ourselves, we will be able to return to the prosperous economy we had before. But we must ensure that we're there to support each other in these difficult times so that we can rebuild our economy and make it even stronger when this is over. Uh, we know uh, that uh, these are exceptional times that have required exceptional measures of investing to support Canadians, uh, to support small businesses, to support the economy at a time of almost uh, total economic slowdown and shutdown. But we also know that Canada, Canada's fundamentals are strong. We have one of the best balance sheets in the G7, which allows us to make the investments we need to keep Canadians focused on what they need to do right now, stay home, take care of their families, look out for their loved ones, with the confidence that our economy will bounce back strongly. If we make sure that people can do the things they can without worrying about the future, there's plenty to worry about right now, about today. So focus on the things you need to do today and know that your job will be there, that your relationship with your employer continues, that uh, we are going to support you through this time and we can come back stronger than ever before afterwards. That is the responsibility of the government of Canada, of all governments in Canada right now, and that is what we're focusing on. With the measures that we've announced until now, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, this uh, payroll support to 75%, and the access to credit for businesses uh, to see them through uh, this time. We know we are positioning ourselves not just to be able to do the things we need to do right now to keep our country safe, but we will be able to come back from this stronger than before afterwards. Bonjour, M. Trudeau, Louis Blouin de Radio-Canada. Radio -Canada. Vous avez accès, vous, à des chiffres, you à des projections, à des projections scénarios. And scenarios. Il y a des gens à la maison And there are people sitting at home right now who are wondering how long they're going to have to stay home. What can you say to Canadians about how long this will take? How long will they have to make economic uh, sacrifices to save lives? Could this last until summer? Well, we're seeing a lot of different potential scenarios. Some are more pessimistic, they're longer than others, but all of this will depend on the choices that Canadians make now and the choices they've made recently and the choices they'll make in the coming days. So if we continue to follow the advice of experts, if we continue to stay home, to limit our travel, to protect ourselves and protect our loved ones, we will be able to come out of this more quickly. Now, what will it look like? 
How long will it last? We know we're talking about weeks and possibly months. But as we see whether or not we're being able to flatten the curve, if we are able to control the spread of the virus, then we'll be able to predict with with greater certainty how long people will be stuck in this protectionist mode. Now, we know that we will have to do everything we can to come through this, and we will be there for as long as it takes. Obviously, many, many different projections of how long this could last, how serious this could be, how many cases we could be facing. Um, but those projections all hinge on choices that Canadians are making today, choices they made over the past few days, choices they will be making over the coming few days. I am incredibly uh, comforted uh, by the number of Canadians who are uh, taking this seriously and protecting themselves, their loved ones, and by extension, our healthcare workers and essential workers who are so important in this time of crisis. And the measures that we've announced and the measures we're announcing today will ensure that Canadians are better able to do the things necessary to keep their families safe through this difficult time. So we will be able to uh, say more about uh, how many weeks or months this lasts for uh, as we see the impacts of the behaviours that people have engaged uh, uh, over these days. Uh, but I am very optimistic that we're going to get through this in the right way because Canadians do what they need to do to be there for each other and to keep us all safe. Now, should we expect an economic update before a budget, and if so, why? Well, we will continue to be transparent about the measures we're putting forward. We are currently investing and giving aid directly to Canadians and small businesses, and we also need to help uh, some major corporations in sectors that have been very hard hit by this crisis. So we've done a lot, but uh, we still have more to do, and at every step we will be transparent about what we're doing so that people can understand, so that people can have confidence, and also so that parliamentarians can do their job and ensure that the government is doing what should be done to help Canadians. Thank you, Lennon Gregor, CTV News. Uh, Prime Minister, at a time when you're rolling out all these programs that are going to require Canadians to interact with government, you're also closing Service Canada centres across the country. And I'm wondering why that decision was taken now at this time, and what your, is your message to people who have, might have trouble accessing government services, uh, particularly people, uh, seniors, uh, and people living on uh, in, in Indigenous communities? Uh, over the past years, we have uh, made significant efforts to ensure that uh, what people can access in the Physical Service Canada centres uh, is also able to be and more able to be accessed online. Uh, as part of uh, the initiative of encouraging people to stay home and work from home, uh, this is something that we realise uh, we can and should be doing. Uh, we uh, want to make sure that Service Canada employers are continuing to work extremely hard to serve Canadians, to respond to their needs, uh, and that's why things are going to be done uh, online and through the phone and we will be making uh, special considerations uh, for uh, people who are particularly vulnerable and have, uh, have difficulties accessing those services. We recognize that we need to be able to serve citizens during these difficult times, but for some time now, Service Canada offices have been making those services totally available online or in person, but now that we are asking people to stay home and work from home, we expect people at Service Canada to continue to serve Canadians from home. Of course, there will be additional measures taken to help those who cannot access the phone or online services. This is your 14th day in self-isolation. Uh, every, every time we've asked you about this, you've referred to doctors' advice. Can you tell us exactly what the doctors have told you about whether or not you have to stay in self-isolation after today? Um, the doctors continue to tell me to stay in, to tell us to stay in self-isolation. Um, but at the same time, we're asking Canadians 
to work from home wherever possible. We're asking people uh, to uh, stay self-isolated uh, as much as possible, uh, to not go out if not necessary, uh, and uh, I am happy to continue to do this. Okay. Uh, I will continue to follow uh, the advice of doctors who are telling me to continue to stay in isolation. But the fact is we're asking Canadians to work from home wherever possible and not to go out if it's not necessary and therefore not to put other people at risk. So I'm happy to continue to do precisely that. Prime Minister, did you or any of your officials know that the U.S. would deport asylum seekers turned away at Canada's border when you struck the deal with the U.S. last week? Um, the work that we've done to ensure uh, that we are uh, staying true to our values and our principles is an extremely important one. We got uh, assurances consistent with the uh, way that the uh, American border officials have interacted with people who attempt to claim asylum at official points of entry, and we are keeping consistent with uh, the uh, safe third country law. That doesn't answer my question. It was a yes or no question, but I have to move on because you've also announced this massive wage subsidy today. Can you give us any specifics on what the conditions will be, whether there is a cap, and how many employers or how, which businesses it will apply to? As we said, we're going to roll out more details about this uh, between now and Monday as we finalize it, but it's important to send that message right now that uh, if you're a small business who's facing the impossible choice of laying off long-time employees because there's just no money coming in and you don't know how long you're going to be able to continue to, to, to keep operating, uh, we're there to help you out. We will uh, send a 75 percent uh, subsidy so you can keep those employees on uh, the payroll so you can continue uh, to support those families who you've worked with for, uh, in many cases, years. Uh, and we can continue to hold together those economic relationships that are going to be so important when we come out of uh, this time of trial for Canadians. As we uh, lean on each other and as we uh, self-isolate and as we slow down and almost stop the economy in many ways, we need to be able to get rolling again quickly as possible once this wave passes us through. Our ability to do that will depend on our ability to uh, be confident in our ability to take care of each other while we're doing it. And that's what we are focusing on right now. Hi, Ashley Burke, CBC News. Prime Minister, there is a lot of uncertainty and unknowns right now, but Canadians are looking to prepare and they are looking to you for guidance. Should Canadians prepare for another five months in self-isolation at home? As I've said, the extent of uh, the, and the length of time that we will have to be uh, self-isolating and going through this uh, freezing of uh, economic activity uh, is uh, very much going to be linked to behaviours and choices that Canadians Canadians make right now. If people are diligent about self-isolating, about staying home, about not uh, risking contact with others or further uh, propagation of this virus, then uh, we will be in for a much shorter time in isolation than others. Uh, but uh, this is what, why it is so important and why we are impressing uh, upon Canadians the importance of uh, being uh, responsible in your choices right now, washing your hands often, uh, engaging in social distancing, physical distancing, two meters apart uh, from others, not going out unless you absolutely have to, and staying at home. Uh, if uh, people can do that, and as we are supporting people enough to allow them to be able to do that, we know that this will last less long. All right, Mullen, uh, Global News. Agriculture groups and others are urging your government to drop the plan to increase the carbon tax as of April 1st. Is that something you're considering? Um, we know uh, that it is important that we put more money in the pockets of Canadians uh, at this point when they're stressed. Uh, our pr plan on pricing pollution, pollution puts more money up front into people's pockets uh, than they would pay uh, with the new price on pollution. We're going to continue to focus on putting more money in people's pockets to support them right across the country. Uh, we know that this is an important measure uh, for, uh, for, for the future, uh, and we're going to continue uh, to ensure that we are uh, thinking about the future while at the same time we ensure uh, that people can afford uh, uh, to make it through this crisis uh, in the best possible way. So yes or no? On carbon tax, will 
we'll go up next week. We continue, um, we continue to make sure that people have more money in their pockets because that is how we designed the price on pollution. Merci, c'est ce qu'il m'a fait à la conférence de presse d'aujourd'hui. Merci tout le monde. And that is the Prime Minister of Canada speaking to Canadians today, a substantial uh, shift in policy, a, a big move that a lot of small and medium-sized businesses in this country were asking for. You might remember last week, the government was promising a 10% wage subsidy for three months. Uh, business organizations, small businesses in themselves said that was not adequate. Uh, today, the government agreeing that that wasn't enough and bringing it up to 75%. Let's bring in Vashi Capellas and David Cochran for some of those details. Start with you, Vashi. Uh, this is a big, a big change and a recognition that the first attempt, uh, the first, you know, try out of the gate here wasn't enough, which we've seen a number of times because governments don't tend to work this quickly on these kinds of policy things. So sometimes it takes more than one go. Yeah, and we had heard over and over again, we've been talking about it for days, that those organizations that represent people who do run small businesses had immediately said, let's look to other jurisdictions which have substantially upped the wage subsidy and copy what they're doing. And that is, in fact, what we saw happen today. So that, it, as you you know rightly characterized it, it's a big jump. It's significant. It's going from ten, a 10% wage subsidy uh, to 75%. The Prime Minister also announced a couple of other things that apply to small business owners, the first being... Uh, a change in sort of or an increase in, in credit, a type of credit available. So some sort of special loan. And, I, and I'm couching my language because I don't know all the details. They weren't all provided here. But a $40,000 loan that would be interest free for a year. And there is the possibility, depending on the conditions, that $10,000 of that loan could also be forgiven. Uh, so that's, that's another significant thing that came out of this announcement. He also, and Peter Armstrong, had flagged importers and the mm -hmm, stress that mm -hmm. they're feeling. A lot of small business owners who are importers. He said that uh, GS GST and HST tax payments as well as duties could be deferred, I believe, until June. Uh, and so he said that acted as, you know, another sort of investment. A couple of things I would flag. The wage subsidy is the biggest part of this announcement, no doubt. That is what small business owners had been looking for. The original one of 10 percent had a cap per employer of $25,000, and it also had a three-month cap for the timeline, the length of time it could be used. We don't have any details yet, and the Prime Minister indicated we might not until Monday on how exactly this one will work. He, he also said qualifying businesses would be able to access this subsidy. We don't particularly know. I mean, there are different ways that small businesses are de defined in Canada. It could be the number of people. It could be according to the tax code. But I'm very keen to find out sort of the, the granular details here because I do think at the end of the day uh, that will matter certainly for the small businesses that we're looking at this. The other part of this is how much does it, over does it cost overall? Uh, because mm -hmm. we are talking already about a $107 billion aid package. Uh, the Prime Minister didn't have an answer when he was asked about that. I'm told that uh, we can expect that from ministers responsible for the file a little bit later today. But this certainly will not be cheap when you're when you're thinking about that number of 75 uh, percent. There are they're the biggest employer in Canada right now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if they're if they're able en masse to access this, it will be expensive. But it certainly, according to everyone we've heard from, is needed. Uh, well, le let me take no credit for the math I'm about to give you here and give full credit to my producer, Phil Ling, uh, who knows that I'm just not good at math. He he calculated, well, we expected the 10% wage subsidy to be almost $4 billion, $3.8 billion. So if we take the same criteria here, uh, the three months and, this, and the same wage cap, which we don't know if that's accurate because we're waiting those details, we're getting closer to $30 billion uh, just, just based on that alone. So it's a, it's a huge amount of money. Uh, David, and, and still, as we see the government really writing big policies on the fly as it's dealing with things just thrown at it constantly, sometimes you have to wait for the details a little longer, but obviously the details will be so critical to the, to the small business owners. Yeah, I'm already getting texts and emails and, yeah. and, and tweets asking me, does it apply to this? And the the, the simple answer is, is right now we just don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it, it was uh, Dr. Ryan with, with the World Health Organization that said speed over over precision is, is how you need to deal with the virus or taking essentially the same approach in, in dealing with the economy and quickly getting this out the door to reassure people to let them know that this level of help is coming and the nitty gritty details are going to come a little bit later so that people broadly can start making informed decisions on, on what help will be there. But, you know, Rosie, in a little bit the way the uh, the, the emergency response benefit 
the, the $2,000 uh, for individuals, the way that tries to put sort of a floor under families and households, mm -hmm. this seems to me is trying to put a floor under neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, when people can go out again and start spending again and start ending the physical distancing and start going back to social embracing, um, <laughs> they need somewhere to go. Yep. And, and, and you need your corner store, your small markets, you need your restaurants, you need your bars, you're definitely going to need your bars. You need those places working and your import-export uh, companies to survive because there is sort of the survival situation we're in of getting through this period of isolation and clamping down on the economy and then there is that recovery period and what they saw a decade or so ago in, in the great you know recession was that a lot of companies weren't able to come back because there was no bottom put under them as what really became a liquidity and credit crunch made it impossible for them to keep their operations they lost their workforce they couldn't bring them back yep. this is an attempt to keep things as whole and as intact as possible with the details, the finer details, TBD. Those will be in place by Monday, is what the Prime Minister is assuring everyone. Okay, I'm gonna put you two on standby, if I can, just for a moment, just to go right away for some reaction to uh, a small business owner. Kristen Rankins, the owner of Fox and Jane Salon in Toronto, and she shut down her business uh, due to COVID-19. Kristen, I, I don't know if you heard there what the Prime Minister said, but basically he's willing, the government is willing, to give small and medium-sized businesses 75% wage subsidy. What would that do for you? Yeah, uh, you know, as a small business owner, I think that we, I can speak for all of us when I say we're keeping our uh, ears and eyes glued to everything that the Prime Minister is saying right now. For us, um, I think what you've been saying about the details really is where we're waiting right now. Um, I'm a salon owner. We have employees, but they work on commission, so we'll still have to see how that applies. Sure. Uh, having access to a loan from the banks that is interest free for a year is definitely a good start for sure. And I think, you know, just lucky that we are moving so quickly on this to begin with. You, uh, I guess you had to lay off some of your, your, your stylists in the salon. Is that what you decided to do? Yeah, we closed uh, right away. Actually, we were trying to prevent any further contamination or, you know, just social distance ourselves before we were even mandated to do it. And a lot of salons in Toronto did that. Um, so we, we definitely had to uh, give our employees leave of absences. And the Prime Minister is saying that this wage subsidy, let's, let's, let's assume you might qualify, uh, but I, I take your point, those details to come on, on Monday. He says it could be backdated to March 15th, and he was encouraging small businesses to hire employees back uh, just to make sure that everybody was sort of taken care of. Is that something you would do if, if you are indeed eligible? Yeah, I mean, if we're eligible, I think that it's a great move. I think it's something, again, uh, it's really hard to speak to a yes or no without more sure. more details. And hopefully on Monday, the Prime Minister will be able to lay that out in a, in a, a more clear plan for us. Um, but yeah, we've been listening. I've already been talking to some of my friends that are other salon owners in Toronto. And what our question is, just how does that apply to us as as in particular to our industry as salon owners, but definitely small businesses in the uh, country for sure. How, how have you been dealing with the, with the stress of this? Um, you know, having a business of your own and, and you're obviously, you know, have to pay yourself and worry about yourself and employees. How are you coping? Well, my dogs are loving it. Um, <laughs> we're having a great time together. Um, they're tired, yeah. um, but you know, um, I feel for my employees. Obviously, my my concern is my business, but my employees, um, they're amazing. I love them. They're my crew. They're my team. I see them so much, and I miss them. It's been two weeks because, like I said, we shut down right away. But we are we talk every single day. I think we're going to have a Zoom meet, meeting later on with each other today. Um, but I'm concerned for them. You know, they all have rent. They have car payments. They have a lot of other payments that other people do. And they're not working right now. They're not making tips. They're not making any mm. money. Yeah. So that's that's a major concern for mine. Um, I've been a salon owner in this city for over 12 years. And, uh, you know, um, in 2008 when this hit, uh, as as a, a salon, you know, yeah. um, we, we did okay. But right now, this mm -hmm. is a different beast altogether because of yeah. social distancing. It sure is. Kristen Rankin, uh, I, hope you, I hope you do qualify and we'll get you more details as soon as we have them too. Good luck, okay? Thank you so much. Okay, stay healthy. Kristen Rankin, the owner Thank of you. Fox and Jane Salon in Toronto. We're going to turn away now from CBC Television. The big news, of course, a major wage subsidy announced by the government. We'll have more coverage on CBC News Network and cbc.ca. I'm Rosemary Barton.
Hello, everyone. I'm Rosemary Barton. Welcome to our CBC News special live from Ottawa. We are live on CBC News Network and streaming around the world on our app and cbcnews.ca. We are tracking the day's big developments on COVID-19 today, much of it to do uh, today with the economy, the latest move by the Bank of Canada to try to cushion the economic shocks from the pandemic, slashing its key lending rate by 50 basis points to a dramatic new low that we haven't seen since the recession back in 2008, 2009. And just moments ago, the Prime Minister announced a massive boost in emergency relief for small business. We've got all of those details. Let me play a clip of the Prime Minister and then we'll get to um, our reporters for more analysis. Last week, we had announced that we would cover 10% of wages, but it's becoming clear that we need to do more, much more. So we're bringing that percentage up to 75% for qualifying businesses. This means that people will continue to be paid even though their employer has had to slow down or stop its operations because of COVID-19. We are launching the Canada Emergency Business Account. With this new measure, banks will soon offer $40,000 loans, which will be guaranteed by the government to qualifying businesses. The loan will be interest-free for the first year, and if you meet certain conditions, $10,000 of it will be forgivable. Our government will also provide an additional $12.5 billion through Export Development Canada and the Business Development Bank to help small and medium-sized businesses with their operational cash flow requirements. And that's the Prime Minister making this uh, new uh, announcement today in order to try and shore up small and medium-sized businesses in this country. It comes after a first attempt to try to uh, help them, promising a 10% wage subsidy. The Prime Minister recognizing today that that was simply not going to be enough. All right, let's bring in Vashi Capellas and David Cochran. We're standing by to bring you the press conference, our daily press conference from cabinet ministers uh, and public health officials. We also have word of another press conference uh, at around 1 p.m. Eastern that we will bring you with the finance minister, Bill Morneau. Um, so I, I don't know if you were able to hear our, our interview with the hair salon owner, uh, Kristen Rankin. Obviously, she's hopeful. She thought it sounded really good, uh, what the prime minister said, but she still has lots of questions. She's not sure, will she qualify, um, and, and many questions. And I, I don't know how much of detail we're going to get even today, Vashi. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it seemed like the indication was they wanted to get this announcement out there and the details would be provided I think as early as Monday, the Prime Minister seemed to indicate. I'm getting some messages saying that uh, Finance Minister Bill Morneau might have some of the answers, but I do think those granular details are really significant, and your guest explained it better mm -hmm. than I ever could, right? <laughs> Small businesses are not just a, a uniform, uh, homogenous group. They have different circumstances in which employees are paid differently. For example, in her, exa for, in her example, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, it's a commission basis, and a lot of retail uh, businesses operate that way so in which way will this apply to them uh, mm -hmm. again I, I bring up the fact that that original 10 percent wage subsidy that was part of the first announcement of financial aid from this government did have some constraints around it for example it was for a maximum of three months and a maximum of twenty five thousand dollars per employer so in what way will those constraints be applied this time? Will they be loosened? I mean, if the same cap is applied, it, it doesn't last for very long for an employer. Sure. And also, given some of the projections that we're seeing today from other um, other financial figures, like, for example, the Parliamentary Budget Officer, that this could last a number of more months, even as far as the end of the summer. And we don't know. It's not a scientific prediction. But still, that's a possibility. Uh, oh. Does that mean that the wage subsidy will be extended longer? Because payroll is something you need revenue to meet and that is what we've heard loud and clear from of course every small business owner and if you continue to not be able to access that revenue because everything is shut down including mm -hmm. your business and people are staying inside it's not like in three months you will all of a sudden be able to meet the payroll so uh, I'm very keen to find out if the finance minister does have some of those details because I do think uh, whether or not you qualify and to what degree you qualify is is going to be you know make the difference for everybody who's very keen for this announcement just let me flag to the control room I'm not sure if you're getting 
getting it too vashy, but there is a, a distorted French signal in my ear. I think it's Radio Canada <laughs> bleeding into my ear as we were all talking. It's a uh -oh. little quieter now, but it is definitely there. So if we could just, because uh, I can function in both languages, but I will start. <laughs> I will start to get confused. So maybe we can take care of that. David, why don't you go through some of the other uh, that that Bank of Canada rate cut? Because I guess we'll hear more from the the finance minister on how significant uh, that is in terms of, as you said, this is all about. And I think it, I think the uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada said too. It's all about sort of shoring up parts of the economy for to get through this and then back out the other side. Yeah, we're kind of seeing a one-two punch of monetary policy and fiscal policy all at once. Uh, there's really not much more Stephen Polos, as governor of the Bank of Canada, can do on the interest rate side. They cut their rates uh, by another half a percentage point down to 0.25 as, as their main overnight lending rate. And that's as low as Stephen Polos says he, he's going to bring it. Uh, the big news, really, though, from the governor of the Bank of Canada was the, the move into quantitative easing. Um, a technical term, I know, but essentially what's going to happen is the bank, every week until this is over, is go and into recovery is going to buy five billion dollars worth of government bonds to put money into the economy to increase the money supply and to make sure that the major banks um, aren't going to have enough cash to be able to keep floating credit and giving people money and, and, and keep the liquidity in the economy. So this is a massive move by Steve, uh, Stephen Polaz, uh, saying that essentially a firefighter never gets criticized for using too much water, and this is a deluge that he is putting into the economy. And that is backed up now by this significant pivot on the spending side uh, by the government of Canada to boost the wage subsidy from 10% to 75% for small and medium-sized enterprises, backdate that to March 15th. Now, we were asking about what are the qualifications on this, what's going to happen there. What I'm being told in a live text conversation that's happening now with the senior government officials that on the wage subsidy, it is going to focus on small and medium-sized enterprises as broadly mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that as many companies as possible qualify for this support just like they did with the revised uh, emergency relief benefit yeah. that was uh, was announced this week they kept broadening it and broadening it and broadening it so the floor that they put under the Canadian economy is as wide as possible and to help them with cash flow the Bank of Canada has made normal loans much, much cheaper. They're going to create the Canadian Emer Canada Emergency Business Account that will allow small and medium-sized enterprises to qualify for up to a $40,000 loan that is interest-free for one year if you meet specific conditions, which we do not want to know yet what those conditions are. The first $10,000 of that uh, could be forgiven. And as well, GST, HST, duty and import payments that were due soon, those are going to be deferred until June. So that's about another $30 billion in remittances that, that companies will not have to make to the government. That's on top of the $55 billion in tax deferrals until mm -hmm. September on the income tax side that they gave people. So that's $85 billion in taxes and remittances that are now allowed to stay with the companies. It's not a permanent solution. It is a yeah. temporary measure, yeah. but it allows them to keep cash and, and keep their head above water uh, as, as they try to flood the economy with even more help. I, I will say that the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses, this is this is the, the, the wage subsidy, this is about what they were asking for, and, and on Twitter at any rate, the, their president has had a positive reaction, but points out a few things in terms of the details, again, that we don't have, asking these questions. Will it include partnerships or unincorporated businesses? What is the cap per employee? As Vashi mentioned, it was 25000 under the previous version, and how long will it last? Again, the previous version of this said three months. So, so we will wait for those mm -hmm. details either today or in the days ahead but I do think it's important for people to realize the breakneck speed at which we are seeing this government and governments around the world react to this pandemic these are things that usually take months and months of planning and calculating and trying to consult and, and talk to lobbyists and, and get everybody on side now being done in a matter of days um, so sometimes the first time out of the gate is not the right answer as, as the government recognized both with the emergency benefit and and with this wage subsidy and sometimes the details as the deputy prime minister has said time and again um, won't come right away because they are trying to send a signal to Canadians and a signal to the economy about um, about what they're attempting to do um, I did want to get Peter Armstrong in but I think I think I'm gonna have to have him wait if the, if he doesn't doesn't mind because the deputy prime minister and the co-chair and president of the Treasury Board Jean-Yves Duclos are coming in to give their um, daily update on the government's response to COVID-19 as well as information from the public health agency um, new details about cases um, and how they are being treated and I believe this time it is the deputy public health officer dr. Uh, new let's listen in live to them now 
Okay. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Uh, sorry to be late. Uh, et merci de vous être Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, I apologize for being late and thank you for uh, waiting. I'll start with our daily reminder to Canadians. We must practice social distancing. Please stay at home unless you are doing essential work like stocking our grocery shelves or working in healthcare. I know that this is really hard, uh, but this is our country's best defense against this global pandemic. Please keep it up, everyone. I'll start by reminding everyone daily that we have to practice physical distancing, stay home, and accept unless you have to do essential tasks such as stocking up on groceries or if you need health care. I know that it's difficult, but this is our best defense against this virus. Don't give up, please. Today, we will hear from Canada's Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Howard New, and uh, du mon cher collègue. And we'll hear from my dear colleague, the President of the Treasury Board, Mr. Jean-Yves Duclos. Mr. New. Hello. Bonjour tout le monde. Globally, Hello, everyone. Over 530,000 cases of COVID-19 affecting all countries. In Canada, there are 4,043 cases, including 39 deaths. These are based on up-to-the-minute COVID-19 laboratory testing results. But it is important to know that at any point in time, there are many other people under investigation, awaiting laboratory tests, or not being tested at all. For this reason, even if you are not hearing of cases in your community, it doesn't mean there are no cases or that there are no exposures waiting to happen. We have now tested over 165,000 people in Canada, which is more than 65,000 additional people tested since Monday. On a per capita basis, that's more than 4,300 per million population, one of the highest rates in the world. In terms of the severity of COVID-19 in Canada, the percentage of cases that require hospitalization remains at about 6%. Those who are critical, critically ill account for about 2.5% of cases, and 1% of cases have been fatal. Severity and fatality rate aren't just a function of the virulence of the virus. The fatality rate will be higher among high-risk populations, which is why we must do all we can to protect the most vulnerable among us. Another cause of increased mortality is overwhelmed health services that are unable to provide intensive care to a high volume of critical cases. For this reason, we must all work to flatten the epidemic curve and protect the health system. I would like to remind Canadians of all ages, do not underestimate the severity of this disease. Every Canadian must follow the advice of public health and heed the dire warnings from other countries who did not have the chance to start soon enough or fight hard enough. We all must strictly adhere to physical distancing, comply with self-isolation orders, and protect and support those who are most vulnerable. I am reminding Canadians of all ages, do not underestimate the severity of this disease. Every Canadian must follow the advice of public health and heed the dire warnings from other countries who do not have the chance to start soon enough or fight hard enough. We must all strictly maintain physical distancing, comply with quarantine and self-isolation orders, and protect and support those who are most vulnerable. The Nouvelle Zélande New Zealand has introduced the concept of staying with inside your bubble and knowing what this bubble is. It's a great way to conceptualize the zone of protection that we need to have around us to keep the virus out. The optimal protection comes when each person has their own separate bubble that is a two-meter circumference around us. But for couples, families, and other cohabitation situations, that bubble might mean two or four or six people, all keeping within a bubble that no one else 
comes into. Whatever your situation is, stay in your bubble. And please, don't step outside of it or burst anyone else's bubble. New Zealand has introduced the concept of knowing and staying inside your bubble. This is a great way to conceptualize the zone of protection that we, to that we need to have around us to keep the virus out. The optimal protection comes when each person has their own separate bubble that is a two-meter circumference around us. But for couples, families, and other cohabitation situations, that bubble might mean two or four or six people, all keeping within a bubble that no one else comes into. Whatever your situation is, stay in your bubble. And please, don't step outside of it and don't burst anyone else's bubble. Thank you. Merci. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. New. Jean-Yves? Jean-Yves, thank you very much, Christian. What's happening right now to the Canadian economy, there seems to be a, it's like a plane stuck in a major storm. And we're trying to land this plane keeping passengers safe. And that's exactly what we did two years ago with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit that helps workers so that we can land this plane and that workers land safely and protect their health. We're going to give people $2,000 a month so that they can take care of their health and that of their loved ones. And we also want to ensure their economic security so they can put bread on the table. Today's announcement is the next step. It's to protect the integrity of the plane itself. This economic plane is extremely important to prepare the rebound that will happen afterwards. We have to ensure that this plane is protected. We have to protect the central engine of the plane, namely small and medium-sized enterprises who ensure the growth of our economy. And that is why we're announcing today the Canadian Emergency Business Account for businesses. We want to give them quickly funding to help SMEs in coming weeks and months. The second measure that we're announcing is that which is just as important is a 75 percent wage subsidy for the large majority of companies that want to continue to work and hire employees, but they need liquidity. They need money to keep their employees and keep paying salaries to their workers. So these are major measures that we, so that we can make our plane safe and so that when we do take off in a few weeks, so that we can do so with a solid economic plane that protects workers and we'll take care of them in the coming weeks and months. Okay. Thank you very much. We're ready to take your questions now. Bonjour, merci. On va commencer par trois questions. Three questions from the phone. Opérateur. Thank you. Merci. We will now take questions from the telephone lines. Nous allons maintenant passer à la période des questions. Please press star 1 at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. Our first question, notre première question, is from Micheline Laflamme avec Radio-Canada. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. À vous la parole. Merci. Thank you. Ms. Freeland. The discussions that you've had with respect to U.S. troops at the border, are these over? Do you have any assurances from the U.S. government that this idea has been set aside? Answer. For the Americans? Well, it's up to them to make announcements with respect to their decision. But I can tell you that yesterday and today we continued discussions with on this topic with our U.S. allies, and I believe and hope that they were listening. Canada's position was absolutely clear and strong. We explained that, in our opinion, having troops at the borders, at the Canadian-American border, is not necessary. And we explained that for us, a measure such as this 
bilateral. Well, we should actually be managing our bilateral relationship. Uh, so uh, it is really for our American neighbors and allies to make announcements about their position. Uh, having said that, uh, we have uh, continued our discussions very energetically. Yesterday and today, I was in touch last night and this morning with our ambassador, Ambassador Hillman, to the United States. Uh, Canada has continued to express clearly and forcefully uh, its view that there is no logical reason to militarize our border with the United States. Uh, and we have been very clear also that such an action would damage our relationship. My second question is for Dr. New. I would like to know, what is the government or what are you doing to help provinces to accelerate the screening analysis process? We've seen a large gap between the various provinces. For example, there are thousands of people waiting in Ontario. So what are you doing in this respect? Also, Given what you're seeing right now, do you think that the measures that have been taken to date could help to flatten the curve? Thank you for your question. Technically, Dr. Tam and myself have worked closely with our provincial and territorial counterparts and ministers from all these areas. This is a key issue, and we continue to work on this to help provinces with their ability to analyze the samples for COVID-19 to date. We know that capacity is something we can support by bulk purchasing resources such as test tubes and other key material for lab analysis. But at the same time, we continue to accelerate evaluating other technologies. For example, in English, there's port of care and rapid testing. And that's something we're working on with our colleagues in our national laboratory. We, we want to use another new technology. We also, if we do want to, we have to validate it. If we do use a test that is not reliable, it could lead to false positive or false negative results. So we do have to do the necessary work to ensure that if we do use other technology for testing, that it is reliable. And we're also con continuing to work on another aspect. We're looking at other technologies such as serology. So we're looking at all means necessary. We're working close with our counterparts to ensure that Canadians will have access to the necessary testing. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, notre prochaine question, is from Janice Dixon with the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Hi, uh, my question is for Deputy Prime Minister Freeland. I, I'm wondering if you can tell me if uh, Canada knew that the U.S. would deport asylum seekers turned back at Canada's border when it struck a deal last week. Uh, thank you for the question, Janice. That is an issue which we are currently discussing uh, urgently with our American partners. Uh, it is very important to Canada to abide by our international commitments, uh, very much including when it comes to refugees. Uh, we are aware of uh, the problems of refoulement, and it was and continues to be important for Canada to have assurances that that would not happen to people return to the United States. So this is an issue which we are urgently discussing now. 
would Canada consider, uh, you know, reversing the policy again if if there is evidence that the U.S. is going to deport those people? I always think negotiations uh, are best conducted in private, and I don't like dealing in hypotheticals. But let me be clear about Canada's position, which is it is important for us to abide by our international commitments when it comes to the treatment of refugees, and we are very alive to concerns around refoulement. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Let our next add, question. And we're clearly alive to those concerns at the time uh, that these agreements were announced. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Next question on the phone, please, before we turn to the room. Thank you. Merci. Our next question. The prochaine question is from Lena Dib avec la Presse Canadienne. Please go ahead. Hello. I have a question about today's announcement. I thought that two days ago the benefit that would help workers to keep their uh, link to employers. How come we need to announce today this new measure, this 75 percent subsidy for SMEs? Is that because this wasn't being done? Jean-Yves, perhaps you could answer that question in French, since, uh, and then I'll answer in English. Jean-Yves, thank you for your question, and you're exactly right. We announced the SERB on Wednesday so that we could remain a link, keep a link with employers. We know that keeping a job is important uh, because Workers are very anxious right now, but we also have to look to the future for companies when they want to bring people back to work. And that's why we announced this this morning and to go beyond this so that employers will be able to keep their ability keep, to keep paying employees wages in coming weeks, uh, given the situation that is evolving. We're offering a 75 percent wage subsidy, and this will allow employers not always to keep, not only to keep their link to employees, but also to keep them on payroll. And uh, if I could just uh, add, um, today's announcement by the Prime Minister on the 75 percent wage subsidy was a very important announcement. Uh, as Jean-Yves has said, uh, our government, the Prime Minister, understand very much the seriousness of this situation. We understand, as we heard from Dr. New just now, that the health situation is likely to get worse before it gets better, and we understand that the economic impact is serious. And so we know that the government has a duty to do whatever it takes to allow our economy to weather the storm. By committing to a 75 percent wage subsidy, the government is taking a major step to help small businesses get through this intact, and it is taking a major step to do something which is so important for Canadians, and that is to keep that connection with their employer. So important to know that you have a job right now, even if the conditions of physical distancing are making it hard to go to work, even if those conditions are making it hard for your company to operate as usual. We get that, and that is why the Prime Minister announced this essential step this morning. And I would point out that the Prime Minister made clear that these measures will be retroactive to the 15th of March. And we very much hope that companies will take that into account and will hang on to their employees and will perhaps bring back people they were thinking of laying off. We're all in this together, and it is so important to keep our economy strong. We acted earlier to be sure that individual Canadians were not penalized for doing the right thing and staying at home to socially distance because of the coronavirus. The measures today are about being sure that Canadian small business is not penalized and indeed has the resources 
that it takes to weather this storm. And I do also want to say this is a difficult situation. We can't mince words about that. And it is probably, it is certainly going to get worse before it gets better. But what the Prime Minister said this morning is a further assurance to Canadians that our government will do whatever it takes to keep Canadians healthy and safe and to keep our economy intact during this situation and to ensure that economically we are in a position to come roaring back when the health crisis has abated. Canada has the ability to do that. We have an exceptional health care system. We had have a very strong federal fiscal position going into this crisis, and we are going to use that position to be sure that Canadians weather the storm and that we are all in good shape and able to shovel our way out when we are able to leave our houses and get back to work. My question is, two days ago, you said that the CERB would allow companies to not lay them off but keep paying their employees and that Ottawa would give the money directly to these people who are still employees but without revenue. Now you're tra changing course. Is that because the companies refused to do what you asked them to do two days ago to keep their employees on the payroll? Um, how come well, we've seen the layoffs uh, from companies in recent days at Cirque du Soleil and others. How come you're offering this now? Three important things. First, there's the general context. We're trying to land this plane, and there are some passengers, workers, who have to be protected. And that is the objective of the CERB that was announced on Wednesday. We also saw that the plane itself needed protection. The motor needed to be protected so that we could kickstart the economy in a few weeks. And that's what we've did with today's announcement. We've given SMEs emergency funding that they'll be able to use. Uh, there'll be 40,000 in loans. The minister will give us more details soon. But... The very fabric of SMEs is fundamental to Canada's economic growth, and we have to give them funding so that when the economy does recover, um, SMEs will be protected. And that's why this morning's fund that was announced it is so important. We're telling entrepreneurs in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada, we're there for you. We are going to support you so that we can protect you in coming weeks and so that we'll be able to count on you once again when the economy will rebound in a few weeks. Third, there is a complementarity between these two benefits. Em employers need empl employees and vice versa. So that is why these two measures go hand in hand. We know that companies have already announced that their connection to their job would be maintained, but with this morning's announcement, they'll be able to continue to, to pay these employees. Companies who are eligible will be able to call their workers back quicker than possible. Of course, they won't lay them off because this connection to their employer will be maintained, but they'll be able to offer them salaries and they'll be able to call them back quickly if conditions allow them to do so. And what's more, companies who would have laid off employees without salary, what we're telling them is that a 75 percent wage subsidy will be paid by the Canadian government. So think quickly, know that we'll be there to support you in coming weeks, and a 75 percent wage subsidy covered by the Canadian government offers you a possibility not to only keep your connection with your employees, but also it allows you to, in coming weeks, to continue to keep them busy and being paid because we're there to protect you, your company, and 
were also there for employees who we need so greatly in the short term and also in the long term as well. Uh, sentences in English on that. I think it's important to see the very strong measures announced by the Prime Minister this morning as complementary to what we have already done. The first step economically taken by our government, quite rightly, was about protecting individual workers, individual Canadians. And it was above all about ensuring that there was no economic reason for people to avoid doing the hard and necessary action of social distancing and of staying home if they were unwell, if their children couldn't go to school, if they needed to care for people who needed to stay home because of coronavirus. We understood that we were asking Canadians to do something that is not only socially hard, but that could have borne a real economic penalty for a lot of people. So it was important to act really swiftly to put some measures in place so that Canadians knew that doing the right thing on the health front would not hurt them economically and to support all those Canadians doing that. The strong action the Prime Minister has announced today is very complementary to those steps and is all about ensuring that our small businesses, the backbone of our economy, are able to get through this intact, viable, still connected to their employees, and that when this period of social distancing comes to an end, as it inevitably will, that our economy is in a position to come roaring back and that Canadians still have their jobs. That's what the, that's what the Prime Minister announced today, a very, very important step, and it should give Canadians a lot of confidence that the government is prepared to do whatever it takes to keep our economy strong. Merci, Madame la Vice-Première Ministre. We'll turn to Thank you. Rachel Haynes, CTV. Minister, uh, Rachel Haynes from CTV. My first question for Dr. New um, is about national guidelines for hospitals who are going to be experiencing a or expecting to experience a lot of critically ill patients coming to hospitals over the next few weeks. We've seen a lot of uh, deaths across the world, and a lot of families, too, are reaching out about critically Ill, Ill patients whose families are on ventilators and they're not able to be by their side, given the measures that are in place right now. Are there going to be national guidelines sent out to hospitals to deal with this reality, or will Canadians have to face the fact that they may not be able to be with their loved ones at this time? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, this is among the many live issues we're actually dealing with at a, what we call an FPT or federal, provincial, territorial level. As I said again, in terms of my level, in terms of public health, uh, the Special Advisory Committee is meeting uh, practically on a daily basis to look at this issue and others. Uh, we recognize that provinces, uh, the provincial officials, are each looking at their own individual plans in terms of the healthcare system, what the needs may be. Uh, there's a lot of modeling and projection going on in each of the provinces and territories, and we are sharing that information at sort of the, at the, sort of the, the table nationally so we can compare our experiences and look at what the issues might be that we could exchange best practices. So uh, in terms of a, a national approach, we recognize that each of the provinces and territories do what's necessary in their jurisdiction, but we at the federal level are always there to support and assist in terms of uh, looking at, at ways we can support in terms of surge capacity, also in terms of what we could do to uh, uh, help out provinces uh, that may not have the same capacity as maybe uh, some of the other ones, because each of the provinces uh, at the present time is that you say is a different part of the, the pandemic curve. Some provinces are harder hit at the present time and others are, are maybe not as far along, but to certainly we need to anticipate and plan for that possibility in those provinces as well. So at the end of the day, uh, we are looking at frameworks and approaches so that at the, uh, as you say, at the end of the day, all Canadians across the country will have access to the healthcare services that they need. Um, okay. Um, my, uh, my question was more about families who would like to be with their loved ones at, if their loved ones are in hospital. How can you visit them? And is that a reality now that you're just not going to be able to see your family? But um, I would also like to follow up on uh, the, the testing that you said, um, is that you said that we have one of the highest rates of testing in the world right now. 
but there are results backlogs of about 10, 11, 12 days that we know of. So why is it so important that we have you're promoting these numbers of tests, but we are not seeing the results? So how is that a good thing that we have all these tests, but we don't have any results yet? Okay, so to the first question, uh, as we all know, physical distancing is the, the most important measure we have in place right now to, to prevent a further transmission of the virus. So uh, certainly at a local level, we can appreciate it's very difficult uh, for, for families that have a loved one that's, that's in a hospital receiving, receiving care. Uh, and so I would defer to the hospitals. Obviously, they're putting measures uh, in place. I think many hospitals have limited or, or, or basically uh, said, no, there's no visitors allowed. Uh, people, I think, understand that, that the need to uh, uh, be able to, to protect uh, other patients and also uh, uh, in, uh, the staff in the hospitals from uh, potential further exposure to the virus. And I think the message we've been giving uh, loud and clear is that everyone should stay home. You only go out for essential activities such as buying your groceries. So I think with that principle in mind, I think people understand, get it, why uh, we shouldn't have, let's say, visitors in hospitals. Uh, to your point about the testing, uh, we have one of the highest testing rates, and the results I've been giving you are the testing results. So we know there are a lot of tests uh, that are still in play, as they say, that are still being waiting to be analyzed. And of course, uh, we, we, we can do better. And I think uh, the provinces uh, are stepping up. I'm aware, for example, the province of Ontario, Quebec as well, they're all stepping up in terms of their capacity, in terms of, the, uh, how you say, a, a faster throughput, if I can put it that way. But in terms of the faster throughput, as I mentioned earlier, it's based on the current technology, the gold standard, which is still the PCR test. So that's with the swab, sending the, res uh, the, the swab in, the sample to get uh, uh, analyzed with a PCR machine, etc. Uh, the other things we're looking at is that are there other testing modalities we can also use? So, for example, we're talking about point of care tests uh, that also would be uh, uh, able to give results in a much shorter time and also be uh, closer to our, where the care is actually being delivered. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, these types of tests, if we they become available and we hopefully expect sooner rather than later, will be a godsend for, for uh, certain types of situations. For example, in a remote and isolated communities that will also decrease the, the testing time because right now with the current technology they have to send the samples you can imagine physically you would buy an airplane uh, to go down to a reference uh, laboratory to get that test result so we're looking forward to having that kind of technology available as well but that takes a bit of time and as I mentioned I think in French earlier we need to validate those tests because there's nothing worse than having a test out there that doesn't give you what we call a uh, valid accurate results uh, there's nothing worse than uh, being sort of falsely re assured uh, and, and not knowing if you have a false positive or false negative test results. So we need to have those uh, uh, tests validated before we're able to roll those out across the country. And then finally, as I mentioned before, there's also serological testing, which would be another, as they say, tool in the toolbox, not to use too many uh, sort of things like that, anecdotes, but it'd be enough, another uh, 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 technology we'd have in our suite of tech, uh, testing technology. So with all those things on the go, uh, we, as I said before, in in terms of even the, the, the increase in our testing uh, results, uh, uh, look how we've increased over the past few days. And if you look at the uh, countries around the world, by uh, sort of what I understand, we're like number three, two or three. I think it's only the United Arab Emirates and I think uh, South Korea that had a higher testing rate per million population than we do. We're about the same as Australia right now. Thank you, doctor. Next question, Julie Van Dusen, CBC. Hi, it's either for Ms. Freeland or peut-être Monsieur Duclos, I'm not exactly Perhaps sure. Perhaps Mr. Duclos. Uh, so your government brought in the emergency benefit um, uh, that's, that's uh, going to give people $2,000 for four months. So I'm assuming you chose four months because you think it's going to last four months, the pandemic, but I'm not sure. The PBO, his report today, um, he estimates that this will go on for six months until August. So what timeline is the government planning for that we will live like this? So I'll start, and I am actually going to ask uh, Dr. New uh, to offer some comments, uh, because uh, that is really a question about public health. Um, and let me just say this. We do know that the health situation is going to get worse before it gets better. And all of us at the federal level, provincially, in cities, in hospitals across the country, are preparing incredibly energetically for that inevitability. 
all Canadians are working really hard to make that worst case scenario as least of a worst case as possible for Canadians. And every single person who is physically distancing, every single person who is making the big sacrifice of not visiting a parent or a grandparent in a long-term care facility, every child who is not going to school is contributing to a better health outcome for Canada and a better health outcome will mean a better economic outcome. This will last. There is nothing I would love you and to Canadians. On this specific date, it's going to be all over. But tell us the things that we can do to get through it with the best health outcomes for Canadians. And then our job as a government is to take the necessary economic measures so that those actions we're taking to keep Canadians healthy, safe, and alive do not hurt our economy and don't hurt individual Canadians. So that's, that is what we're doing. And I will leave it to Dr. New, perhaps, to offer a bit more of a health perspective. We're, lo we're looking at a lot of scenarios. Provinces are looking at a lot of scenarios. And our health care scenarios are very much connected with the economic uh, thinking that we are doing. It's one reason why you're seeing the economic thinking developing, why you are seeing new proposals coming out very regularly because this is an evolving situation. Dr. New, and then maybe Jean would like to add something, Seba? What I can say is that from uh, from the public health perspective, uh, there, there's a tremendous global collaboration. Uh, you know, we're we're in uh, regular contact, uh, Dr. Tam, myself, and, and others, uh, with the World Health Organization, with our partners internationally, such as the CDC in the United States. We're constantly sharing information, best practices, looking at the experience of what's happened, what's worked, what hasn't worked in other countries, uh, uh, the changing epidemiology, looking at the science and the evidence, and, and using a uh, like I say, uh, the best measure we have at the present time, which is physical distancing. And, and the reason for that is that we're trying to buy time. Uh, we talk about things like flattening the curve, planking the curve. It's all to buy time, to not overload our healthcare system. As scientists around the world, including ours in Canada, are, are, are working uh, day and night to try and find that, that vaccine, that treatment that would help also uh, uh, lessen the burden of illness, uh, both here in Canada and around the world. And, and, and I guess to your question, it, we're in it for the long haul. It's not going to be uh, days and weeks. It's definitely months, many months. And uh, uh, the one thing uh, that uh, other countries are also looking at, and we're looking at as well, is that is there a possibility of a second wave? Who knows? I think Dr. Tam mentioned it. Uh, I would agree with her. We're, we're looking at all possibilities and, and planning, uh, uh, planning for all potential scenarios. So briefly, uh, I would uh, just add that despite the uncertainty that we all see, both on the health side and on the economic uh, side, we really need to, and I see we, the federal government as well as all governments, we need to demonstrate to Canadians that we are there to help each other and that we are there to provide the hope that we need to go through this, uh, this crisis. And that hope is better supported when Canadians understand that from certainly both a health and an economic perspective, we'll be there to support them. So tomorrow, this morning's announcement is exactly that. We're going to support you, both the workers and the small and, and, and medium-sized businesses and, and everyone else important in, the, in our uh, economic fabric, because we all need to go through this together. So confidence and feeling that we're all there to support each other are key, not only messages, but key actions, items that we are again uh, delivering today. So, Dr. Tam, my second question flows out of what you've just said, and that is uh, you've repeated often that it's going to get worse before it gets better. What do you mean by worse? What does that look like? And uh, what's being done to prepare for a surge, I'm assuming? So we always prepare for, for the worst, but uh, hope for the best. Uh, in terms of the worst is that uh, we've already seen experience in Quebec 
where uh, they've had a spike in cases. Uh, part of it, I think, and I've been uh, communicating closely with colleagues in Quebec, is due to the fact that they've decentralized their testing. So before it was all the laboratory results had to be verified at, at sort of the provincial lab level. Now I understand there's a, there's a network of 10 laboratories, so they're able to actually uh, uh, do the testing and have the results come out sooner. Uh, they're also saying that part of the spike is because Quebec, compared to the rest of Canada, their March break was earlier. So I think it was at the beginning of March. And therefore, we're now seeing, as we always know, because of the delay in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, people having been exposed, and then now we're getting the results of people who become ill and get their test results. That's why that explains, in part, the spike of cases in Quebec. So in terms of the worst, uh, as we know, Ontario had their March break uh, a week later. Uh, we, uh, I think on Friday 13th, uh, uh, March the 13th, told Canadians, hey, avoid all non-essential travel outside of Canada. Many people before, uh, maybe just, uh, you know, even during that time, were still going on their vacations outside of the country, etc. cetera. Uh, we also have the snowbirds, uh, uh, et cetera, and many other Canadians around the world. And we know that there's an increased uh, risk of exposure to a uh, COVID-19 uh, in many parts around the world. So with these people now coming back, uh, we're, we're, we're telling people physical distancing is, is so important, but it waits to, uh, we remain to, it remains to be seen. Uh, what comes of it in terms of the, these people uh, maybe becoming ill with COVID-19 and then uh, uh, seeking medical care, getting tests and getting those re results. So, so that's what we might anticipate as, as sort of uh, being the worst. And then hopefully now with everyone, understanding the, the, the absolute, absolutely critical uh, importance of physical distancing, that hopefully in the weeks to come, we will see the effects of that, that, that positive measure. The other point maybe I'll, I'll make at this point, because I understand there are some uh, questions have been out there in terms of uh, the mandatory uh, you know, order under the Quarantine Act that came into effect. And maybe I'll just want to walk people through that, because I know there's been maybe some, some confusion in terms of uh, quarantine, self-isolation, what happens to travelers coming back. So I, I'd like to maybe unpack that to make it crystal clear to all Canadians. Uh, Uh, that's that's that certainly that's that's the next step in terms of making sure that we don't get that we don't add to the surge. The surge might be what happened a few weeks ago, and and the measure we're putting in place is to prevent an even a, a further increase in that surge. If you'd like me to get. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with the mandatory order uh, under the Quarantine Act, all travelers coming to Canada now are subject to an order of quarantine, and that's a serious, uh, a serious uh, uh, issue. And, and certainly, that's a, a very strong measure that our Minister uh, of Health, uh, Minister Haidu, put in place uh, on March 25th. And so, the easiest way to, to look at it is that you have people who come to Canada who might be ill. Uh, with, with symptoms, uh, maybe arriving at a land border or, you know, maybe even uh, by air, even though they could or should have been checked uh, before they boarded their flight. And of course, what we call travelers coming back who have no symptoms and look and feel well. So the ones who are ill, that's straightforward. It, it's always been in the Quarantine Act. If you have an ill traveler at, at the border, uh, certainly with our quarantine officers, we would, we would take uh, charge of these people, make sure they get the appropriate medical follow-up, uh, isolation, make sure that uh, we do it in the best interest of their health and also obviously to protect uh, Canadians here in Canada. I would remind people also that it's, uh, it's in everyone's best interest, including the traveler, to declare if you're not feeling well at the border. I've heard uh, stories about to people maybe hiding symptoms, etc. I can give you an anecdote. Uh, there was an individual not giving away any sort of pri uh, medical confidentiality that arrived at the border, wasn't feeling well, was taken into quarantine, and in a number of uh, uh, several hours later, deteriorated rapidly and is now in an intensive care in a hospital. So it's actually, it was good that that person was honest and told us about uh, their symptoms. So that just gives you an example of the seriousness. Now we're saying that for uh, Asymptomatic travelers who come to Canada, uh, get home as fast as you can. If you're asymptomatic, you're still well, uh, the direction is go home as quick as you can by the most direct route. Do not stop for groceries. Uh, just get home. Uh, if that means an onward travel with a domestic flight, we will give you a mask and, and, and make sure that uh, you get home safely. Um, and once you're home, you are under quarantine. That means you stay home. Uh, if you have a property uh, and you want to get some fresh air and you have a balcony or your backyard, yes, you, you, can, you can go out there, but that's it. No bike rides, uh, no walking around in the neighborhood. You are under quarantine. I don't know how much clear I can make it, but that's, that's it. 
So uh, that's really the, uh, the, what we're putting in place. And, and I hope Canadians and everyone understands that is the, the expectation requirement under the, the Quarantine Act and the order that's put, been put in place. Thank you. I just want to add one thought, Julie, to your question about a surge, which is, you know, talking about surges, talking about the reality, which is this will get worse before it gets better, can make people feel powerless. And if you are home, physically distancing in your house, maybe your children are home with you, you can feel even more powerless. And that is not how we should be feeling. Canadians should be feeling very powerful. And Canadians should be feeling powerful because each one of us can make a really significant contribution to our country getting through this and to our country avoiding the kinds of really nightmarish situations that we've seen in countries like Italy. And we can make that contribution by doing what Dr. New has described, by being really rigorous in practicing physical distancing. Now, that is hard for individual Canadians, and it is hard for Canadian companies. And that's why what Jean-Yves said is absolutely the case, which is the government is here to get us through this. We will provide whatever economic support is necessary for Canadians to do what it takes to get through this global pandemic. So I want people to be realistic, to do the hard things each individual Canadians need to do, but also to be hopeful, to feel very powerful, and to know that we are going to get through this because we are a country that knows how to act collaboratively and that knows how to listen to our experts. Okay, so maybe one last question from the room and one last question from the phone. Mike Global. Um, <clears throat> Dr. New, when the millions of items came from wherever, the PPE equipment that we were talking about yesterday, um, when is it actually going to get here? You know, we were supposed to be sent millions of extra things from PPE from China and elsewhere. Is it, is it, has it shown up or is it, when is it, when is it going to show up? Well, there's, there's quite a range of equipment that, that uh, certainly that's been ordered. Uh, we're working uh, uh, day and night, uh, obviously, uh, with our, our provincial territorial colleagues to get the equipment into Canada. And I can't give you an exact time or date for all of the various pieces and types of equipment, but uh, rest assured that uh, we're looking uh, across the globe and also obviously in Canada to assure that we do have the supplies equipment we need here in Canada. For hospitals who are running out of PPE, um, what is the situation there? And can we guarantee that front frontline healthcare workers are getting the protective equipment they need to do their jobs? Certainly in terms of PPE, uh, we recognize that the frontline healthcare workers, all frontline workers who are at risk of exposure due to dealing with uh, sick patients, uh, they need the PPE. And so uh, uh, I could say we're working. Uh, right now, I understand, yes, that there are uh, uh, imminent shortages or, 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 or issues in the hospital. The one thing I would also stress is that uh, as we're working uh, very hard to make sure that these workers get their, they get their PPE that they need, we would also remind the general public, uh, I don't know if it's still the case, but uh, uh, there are a lot of people in the general public that uh, wouldn't be, uh, how we, I would say, uh, needing such type of equipment. Some people might be, uh, to be honest, stealing them or, or acquiring them uh, in some other fashion that uh, that's completely inappropriate. Uh, we need to save our PPE for those who need it, our frontline healthcare workers, and not for someone to put on, the, on their face if they're going to the grocery store to get their groceries. So I can't stress that enough. Okay, one last question for the phone. For those who are still on the line and want to stay on for the next press conference by Minister Morneau, please do. You don't have to redial in, but we'll take one more question on the phone. Thank you. Merci. Our last question is from Mary Bastel avec Le Devoir. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Good morning, Mr. Duclos. I have a question about the decision to close Service Canada offices. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. 
Question. You closed Service Canada offices, and there are people who are concerned this morning to hear that these offices will be closed, even though there's a great re demand for assistance from the government. How come we didn't consider these es essential services in this situation? Answer. Thank you for your question. I would like to answer generally at first and then give you more details after. Generally, what we absolutely have to do is to serve Canadians in need, and this involves services services offered by Service Canada. But we also have to protect the health and safety of employees of Service Canada. In recent hours and days, we've had incidences where employees of Service Canada uh, saw their health and safety at risk. And like any responsible employer, when this happens, we have to react to protect the health and safety of our employees. So, Service Canada services will continue to be offered by, in four ways. First, by significantly increasing the number of agents that work, for example, EI. There are more than 1,000 employees that were redistributed to this program for employment insurance. And second, we're going to ensure that employees can work in a safe environment by offering them appropriate measures to offer services by telephone so that people can receive the services that they're entitled to. And third, some people who have issues accessing these services, whether they have mobility issues or they have a particular disability, these people will be able to have appropriate services offered under specific conditions. This is offered in both a respectful way and a responsible way. And lastly, we'll continue to ensure that requests for EI coverage, uh, requests that were made after March 15 will move to the new emergency benefit so that people don't have to uh, follow up with EI. These requests will be naturally sent and easily sent to this new Canada emergency benefit that we announced on Wednesday. So, overall, we're protecting the health and safety of the Service Canada agents, and at the same time, with Wednesday's announcements, we're offering additional services with the CERB so that Canada can deliver services and benefits that Canadians are entitled to on normal times, during normal times, but also during a crisis as well. Question. You're saying that this series of measures will accelerate access to these benefits, but you've talked about the 1,000 uh, cases that were redirected to EI, but this was the case before you closed Service Canada centres. So are you going to have more people on the phone or somewhere else to help people who can no longer go to Service Canada centres to request these services? And my other question is, given C-13, which bans people f from requesting this CERB if they've voluntarily left their job, so if someone has to leave their job because their daycare is closed and they have to take care of their kids, or they don't feel it's safe to go to work, and we're telling people to stay at home. What do you tell these people who think that they won't be able to request this CERB because they voluntarily left their job and they're in that situation? Answer? Uh, yes to both of your questions. The first, for Service Canada, because we physically closed Service Canada offices, because their agents uh, weren't able to help people in person, we've added additional time and resources to allow them to answer calls and uh, fulfill online requests. So most of these requests that are submitted online and they'll have more time now to 
process requests because they won't be doing it in person. My second, your second question about the standards and conditions for receiving the CERB, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. There will be many more details that will be, be coming in in the next few days so that we can protect uh, Canadians with this new benefit because Canadians understand that it is an urgent situation that led us to establish this benefit. We've never seen situations since the Second World War, and we've never had to implement such a measure of this scope. So Quebecers and Canadians in particular are uh, asking legitimate questions, and we will be providing answers and, and good answers in, in the coming future. Thank you. That ends our press conference for today. Please stay in line if you want to participate in the next conference. Okay, and that is our daily update from uh, cabinet ministers and public health officials here in the nation's capital. We're actually going to stay on a little bit longer with you because the finance minister, Bill Morneau, and the governor of the Bank of Canada are expected also to come and speak to us in about 10 minutes' time, and we want to bring that to you as well. I'll bring in my uh, colleagues, Vashi Capellis and David Cochran. I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time before we go into um, the economics of things and what we might expect to talk about the testing, um, because I, th I think that's a really vital piece of information for, for Canadians. Um, and Dr. New, the deputy public health officer, uh, confirmed today that 165,000 tests have been done in Canada, so that's 65,000 more since Monday. Day. And I say this is vital information because every public health expert will tell you more testing is, is a good thing. Um, and he also points out, Dr. New points out, that this is one of the highest rates per million in the world. And I can tell Canadians that if you compare what we have done to the United States, for instance, because that would be uh, an important measure for us, I think, um, we have done, Canada has done 52,000 more tests than the U.S. as of today, and a reminder that we are uh, one-tenth the size of the United States. So um, the claim that we are doing pretty well per million on testing is accurate, um, and it, it, it is important because, as we heard from Dr. New and from the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, things are going to get worse, and, and people need to prepare for that um, and, and think about that as they see these numbers moving forward. Um, I, okay, I'm just actually, I'm going to put you two on pause as I do. I'm sorry. I'm going to go live to Quebec City because provincial officials there are giving an update. And in fact, that was one of the provinces they highlighted uh, a spike of cases there because their spring break was earlier than most. Take a listen. Mr. Premier. Yes, hello to everyone. First, I want to give a huge thanks to those who registered yesterday to go volunteer. Quebecers are so generous, and uh, it really made the portal block because too many people wanted to be volunteers, and I'm not surprised. But now the portal is once again in working order, and we already have 12,000 people who have been matched with organizations. So thank you so much to all Quebecers. Quebecers are generous, and we can be proud of that response. Now, I had told you in the course of the past few days, we were expecting to get to this new stage, a more critical stage, and you will be seeing the results today will be showing that. So today, we have 10 deaths more. We are now at 18 deaths. Of course, in the name of Quebecers, I wish to offer my most sincere sympathy and condolences to the families and the loved ones. I know it's hard. Myself, when I learned it this morning, 10 deaths in just the one day, it's hard. And although I had been warned for a few, uh, I've been warned for a few days now that, that we get to that, but we have to continue onward to try to limit as much as possible the number of deaths for the rest. We have 2,021 cases that are confirmed. That is an increase of 392. 141 people are hospitalized. That is an increase of 35. We have 50 people in intensive care. That is an increase of seven. 
On, euh, du côté du nombre de tests. As far as the number of tests are concerned, we've increased the number of tests, but we are validating the number of tests that were done in certain regions. So we'll get back to you tomorrow with updated numbers. But as you can see, we have increased the number of tests since we have more cases, more positive cases. One word, because of course, when we look at those numbers, we can see that we have more people who are infected than in the other provinces. The explanation of public health is to say that our spring break in Quebec ended up being in the worst of times, right before people being told to stop traveling. So we had a lot of people who did travel right before at the last minute. So that affected our numbers, our results. I would like to come back to the guidelines as well. Yesterday, I saw on social media, amongst others, there are many, pieces, many people who said that my call to volunteers was a bit contradictory, so I'd like to come back to that and, and speak about it. First of all, I'm asking Quebecers, you know, Quebec is on pause right now. As much as possible, we have to all remain at home, except to give or to receive essential services. So everyone at home, except to go get essential services or to render essential services. So of course, people have to go out to go to the grocery store to get something to eat. Of course, as well, we need to have people who give those essential services. And when we talk, for example, about helping people 70 and over to help them to go get food for them, well, we need volunteers. When we're talking about having food banks, in order to be able to give food to those who need it, well, we need volunteers to do that. So volunteering, we're not talking here about social volunteering, generally speaking. We're talking about specific volunteering to give and render essential services, such as feeding everybody. So you stay home unless you need to go get essential services or you are rendering those essential services. Now. Walking, taking the walks. It's nicer now. Uh, anyway, in Quebec City, it's nice outside. It's important to go and have a walk. You can go walk around, but if you do so, be careful to stay two meters away from other people. If you are infected with the virus, if you have symptoms of this of the virus. Do not go out for a walk. Now, there's all the question of travelers, people who are coming back, who have come back in the past few days. You are at a much higher risk than the average of Quebecers of having the virus and therefore of transmitting it. So ideally, stay at home. If you absolutely have to go have a walk, and I'm talking here about the people who came back from traveling, well, it's even more important for you to stay two meters away because you are at risk of having and transmitting the virus. So, of course, we don't want to give it to anybody else. Now, a guideline that's become very important, and I had promised you to tell you all the truth all the time and to warn you. When we're talking about interregional circulation, when we look at the numbers right now, there are two regions that are more affected than the others, Montreal being one of them, and the Eastern Townships, the S3 region. So that means two things. It means that the people who are in Montreal and the people who are in the Eastern Townships, it's even more important to stay home as much as possible. That also means that all Quebecers who are not in Montreal or in the eastern townships, well, don't purposely go to those places, only go if it is absolutely necessary, because if we keep the proportion in mind, there's a lot more infections in Montreal and in the eastern townships. We're not yet at the stage where we're going to close down those areas, but don't purposely go to Montreal or to the eastern townships. Now. 
Another question that was asked of me yesterday, and I was able to think about it last night. People who continue working and who are making less than $2,000 per month. I can understand that it can appear to be unfair. So I asked the Minister of Finance to find a way to compensate you. So give me a little bit of time, because it's not that simple to set up. But I'm telling you, those who are continuing to work and who are making less than $2,000, you will be compensated. Trust me, the measure is going to be announced as early as we can, but I have asked the Minister for Finance to set that up. Speaking of the Finance Minister, while well, you saw that there are measures that have been announced by the federal government, a few minutes or hours ago for businesses. We've also had discussions with the federal government for businesses, for the provincial sales tax and federal sales tax remittance. So to give them a bit of oxygen and breathing room, we have agreed okay, to Okay, this is the, the Quebec Premier Francois Legault. We're going to leave him for a moment to go to another press conference, but let me just highlight the news from the Quebec Premier, and that is that there have been 10 deaths uh, in, in the last day in Quebec, bringing them to a total of 18 deaths in the province. And I should also tell you that they have uh, the highest number of cases um, in the country with now more than 2,000 cases. Well, An important you, point, though, before I go to Mr. Morneau, just to contextualize here. Um, Quebec had its spring break before uh, most of the rest of the country, and that is at least in part why they have seen this spike of cases and the number of deaths. We know that Ontario's spring break was a couple weeks later, so that's why we may see a delay in what we are first seeing in Quebec in other parts of the country. So just keep that in mind. Now, let's go to the economic measures the government announced earlier today. This is the finance minister, Bill Morneau. Through this, but it is most certainly a challenge for everyone. It's a reminder of how this disease is impacting so many people. Our work to contain this virus just cannot cease. We're all in this together. The same is true for our economy. Canadians and Canadian businesses are experiencing very real economic issues as a result of this outbreak. I also want to thank the manufacturers, the workers and the business owners who are making sure Canada is prepared and is well stocked with medical equipment and other necessities. And the grocery and the pharm pharmacy workers who are making sure that Canadians have the food and the medicine that we need. I would like to thank all first line healthcare workers. I would also like to thank manufacturers, workers and business owners, as well as grocery workers and pharmacy workers who make sure that Canadians have the food and the drugs that they need. From the very beginning, we're prepared to do whatever it takes to support Canadians. That includes supporting the businesses that Canadians own and run. I know that many business owners have poured years into building businesses that support families, that support communities, across the country. This morning, the Prime Minister announced new measures for businesses as part of Canada's COVID-19 economic response plan to support businesses and to protect our strong economy. I know that many businesses and self-employed people are worried about the GST, HST payments and customs duties that are coming due. Effective immediately, any payments that are due at the end of March, in April, in May, are now deferred until the end of June. This measure will leave businesses with around $30 billion of cash in hand to help businesses pay workers, pay suppliers, pay their businesses rent or mortgages, and any other expenses coming due. As we have said from the very beginning, we are ready to do everything to help Canadians. That includes support for companies, that are owned and managed by Canadians. This morning, the Prime Minister announced the next series of measures to support companies in Canada's economic intervention against COVID-19. From now, GST, HST payments expected for the end of March, April and May are deferred to the end of June. This measure will allow companies to have more money in their bank accounts so that they can pay workers, 
providers, as well as any other outlay. The Canada Revenue Agency is also reducing the administrative burdens of businesses at this time. This will give Canadian business owners more time to manage pressing challenges. We know that leaving cash in the hands of businesses is only one part of the solution. During this time, some businesses may need cash injections to stay strong. We're announcing three new programs to help businesses, particularly small businesses, to access capital. This morning, the Prime Minister announced the new Canada Emergency Business Account to provide small businesses and not-for-profits with interest-free loans of up to $40,000. This funding will support the, the Main Street businesses that give our communities their character. The local restaurants, the corner coffee shops, the small travel agencies, the salons and barber shops, and the many other small businesses that help form the very backbone of Canada's economy. This program will provide $25 billion of support for Canada's small businesses. Loans will be available through eligible financial institutions and will be fully guaranteed and funded by the Government of Canada. Fully guaranteed and funded. And anyone who pays the loan off by December 31st, 2022, will see 25% loan forgiveness, up to $10,000. This will help businesses have more money at this challenging time. More details will be coming shortly. Le gouvernement fédéral est également the, the federal government also announced a new emergency account for Canadian businesses to offer small businesses no interest loans, interest-free loans, up to $40,000. Whoever borrows this money up to December 31st this uh, year will see a 25% uh, forgive loan forgiveness up to, uh, to a maximum of $4,000 to help our businesses. More details on that will follow. This funding will support restaurants, coffee shops, travel agencies, and, air and salons, and many other small businesses that make our country so great. These loans will be completely guaranteed and funded by the Canadian government. We also want to make sure that Canada's small and medium-sized enterprises can keep operating throughout this challenge. Our government recognizes that many are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19. Export Development Canada will work with financial institutions so they can issue new operating credit and cash flow term loans of up to $6.25 million to small and medium-sized businesses in Canada that may be particularly vulnerable to the economic impacts of COVID-19. This program will provide an additional $20 billion of support. We also announced a new co-lending program for small and medium-sized enterprises. The Business Development Bank of Canada will team up with financial institutions to offer loans up to $6.25 million to help keep them operating. This program will invest an additional $20 billion in Canadian businesses. Businesses will be able to apply, apply and receive these loans directly through financial institutions. Small and medium-sized enterprises will be able to access both programs and use this money to keep up operations and keep our economy stable. Nous voulons également nous assurer we also want to ensure that Canada's small and medium-sized businesses can continue to uh, function during this crisis. Our government will give financial institutions funding so that they can offer new loans of up to $6.2 million for Canada's small and medium-sized businesses, businesses that may be that are especially vulnerable to COVID's effects. We have also announced a new co-funding program. Canada Development, Canada's Development Bank, BDC, will be able to offer loans of up to $6.25 million to help SMEs continue to function. Businesses will be able to ask to receive these loans directly through financial institutions. These announcements represent $65 billion in direct support and an additional $30 billion of deferred taxes for a total of $95 billion in additional support for the Canadian economy at this time. 
ensemble, ces annonces Together, these announcements represent $65 billion in direct support and $30 billion in deferred taxes for a total of $95 billion in supplementary support to the Canadian economy at this time. This program will roll out in the next three weeks, and interested businesses should work directly with their current financial institutions. I want to make special mention that today is the last Friday of the month. I'm told seniors get their checks today, typically, and usually head to banks to deposit them. I'd ask people to be vigilant in thinking about how our actions affect our vulnerable neighbours. Please consider giving seniors who are very worried about coronavirus spaces at bank branches today. Canada's COVID-19 economic response plan is supporting businesses through a variety of measures. Two weeks ago, I launched the Business Credit Availability Program. Nine days ago, we deferred income tax payments until August 31st of this year. This week, we increased credit for farmers and the agri-food sector. The government's also introduced measures to help businesses to support employees. Enhancements to the work sharing program have been particularly important. A temporary 10% wage subsidy for up to three months that will provide up to $25,000 per employer. But today, we announced a new wage subsidy of up to 75% for qualifying small and medium-sized businesses for up to three months, retroactive to March 15th. This will be coming soon. This program is intended for businesses that experience significant revenue reductions because of COVID-19 and decide to keep their staff and pay them in full. More details will, as I said, be available soon. The new Canada Emergency Response Benefit is available to employees who are still employed but are not receiving income because of disruptions to their work. That can be because of uh, anything to do with COVID-19. Preserving the connection between employer and employee for when business gets back to normal. Aujourd'hui, nous avons annoncé une nouvelle subvention salariale pouvant atteindre 75% pour les petites et moyennes entreprises éligibles. For qualifying businesses for up to three months, retroactive to March 15. This program is intended for businesses that experience significant revenue reductions because of COVID-19 and decide to keep their staff and pay them in full. More details will be available soon. That businesses in certain sectors have been particularly impacted by the economic impact of the COVID-19 epidemic. We've been working directly with firms in the airline industry and on a program for the energy sector. More details on these discussions and the conclusions will be available soon. We know particularly affected sectors have urgent needs for credit. We've worked directly with airlines and on a, on a program for the airline, uh, airline sector as well as a program for the energy sector. More details on that will soon follow. We know that these areas are particularly affected and have urgent needs in terms of credit. So that when the time comes, and it will come, businesses can bounce back quickly and get Canadians back to work. In these uncertain times, so much is still unknown. But I want you to know this. Your government will be backing you up all the way. We'll be here to support Canadians every step of the way. Thank you very much. Now I'm quite pleased to be sitting here with the Governor of the Bank of Canada, Stephen Polos, who has a few things to say. Thank you. Well, thank you, Minister. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Good afternoon, everyone. History of the global financial crisis and its aftermath we're well aware that central banks in general have modest room to maneuver. Accordingly, it has been a consensus in a profession for quite some time that the next major economic shock would need to be dealt with mainly by fiscal policy. This is the case today, not only because interest rates are already low, but because of the nature of the shock that we face. Now, monetary policy is not going to have its usual effects in an economy that has been shut down. Fiscal policy, though, has the right tools for this situation, and the measures that have been announced will buffer Canadians and the economy from the effects of this shock. Now, monetary policy is playing an important complementary role in this situation, 
We effectively need to stop the clock, allow our medical experts to combat the virus, and then restart the economy afterward. Companies and individuals need access to credit during this period. People expect to be able to go out and use their credit card, draw on their HELOC. Companies expect to be able to draw on their credit lines. This all requires that the financial system continue to operate normally. And that is why the bank has focused its efforts on measures that ensure financial markets function and credit remains available. This means buying various financial assets so market participants can get the liquidity that they need. And already, these actions have increased the Bank of Canada's balance sheet by about $90 billion over the past two weeks. Now today, we've moved our interest rate to 0.25%, which for technical reasons we consider to be its lower bound. We are also launching a commercial paper purchase program to help improve the functioning of that market, which is a key channel credit for companies. Today, we lowered our interest rate to 0.25%, which we consider its lowest possible rate. We've also begun, be, begun a purchasing program paper to be able to help short-term financial markets. The government of Canada's securities market is foundational to our financial system. It has been functioning reasonably well in the circumstances, but the level of liquidity has been well below normal. Accordingly, we have announced today that we will begin to acquire Government of Canada bonds for our balance sheet. In our monetary policy toolkit, we call this large-scale asset purchases, LSAPs. But many prefer to use the term quantitative easing, or QE. Our objective of this at this time is to ensure properly functioning financial markets, and the program may be adjusted depending on market conditions. However, to reduce financial market uncertainty, we are also committing today to continue purchasing Government of Canada bonds until the economic recovery is well underway. We are confident that such low interest rates as low as possible and a fully functioning financial system will prepare us for the coming economic crisis once this crisis has ended. We are confident that having interest rates as low as possible and having well-functioning financial markets will lay the foundation for a robust economic recovery once this crisis has passed. Thank you. Say thank you, Governor. Thank you, uh, all of you, for being here. We're uh, very hopeful to have the opportunity to answer your questions and give you more sense of what it is we're announcing today. Um, thank you. So uh, for today, we'll be starting on the phone. We'll take three questions on the phone, come back to the room, and then go back to the phone. Please limit your interventions to a question and a follow-up. Moderator, it's up to you. Thank you. Merci. Our first question, the première question, nous vient de Alex Ballingall with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, just looking at uh, uh, there's so many uh, measures in the past couple of weeks, it's almost hard to keep track now. You mentioned $95 billion in, in spending in these three uh, measures for businesses, but can you give us a sense of how that adds to the, the spending that was in the rescue package that passed on Wednesday and, and where we're at in terms of a total COVID-19 fiscal response? Well, thank you. And I, I understand that, uh, that you're, you're saying that these things are moving quickly. I think all Canadians know that this, this challenge is, uh, is one that we need to react to on a, on a day-by-day -day basis to make sure that we are having the sort of impact on people and that we can recover in a way that we, we know is important. So that's really been why we've been making these announcements on a, on a very regular basis. What we talked about earlier this week and the legislation that was passed represents, uh, when you look at the direct measures to people, 
uh, $52 billion in direct measures to Canadians, primarily delivering money to people through the Canada Emergency Response Program, the benefit that will allow people to have $2,000 per month for 16 weeks. So that's the, the important part. There's a number of other things, as you know. Then on top of that, uh, we've had $55 billion in deferral of uh, income taxes for individuals and for businesses. So that's how we got to the $107 billion number. What you're hearing today is something a little bit different. You're hearing about an additional deferral of taxes that we see roughly in the order of magnitude of, of $30 billion. So that should be added to the $55 billion. And on top of that, credit that rec represents another $65 billion of credit. And so that's going to enable the, uh, the businesses that go out and, and talk to their, their financial institutions uh, to access credit. And very importantly, that includes the $40,000 um, per uh, small business uh, loan opportunity, an interest-free loan that uh, if people pay that back before December 31st, 2022, they will have uh, 10, up to $10,000 or 25% of that loan forgiven. So that's, uh, that's how that works. So we appreciate that this is, this is changing fast. I can tell you that we will continue to remain on top of it to ensure that people are supported, to make sure that uh, businesses are supported, and to ensure that we have an economy that can come out of this challenge in a way that will continue to provide opportunities for Canadians. <clears throat> And just as a follow-up, you mentioned in your uh, remarks uh, that the wage subsidy will be for businesses who, who decide to keep their staff. Can you, can, you, can you clarify what that means? Does that mean if a business has laid off some employees through this that they wouldn't be eligible or they'd have to rehire to get the wage subsidies? Uh, what does that mean exactly? Well, I want to be really clear. We're, we're, we're making sure that we're supporting Canadians who are impacted by this COVID-19 uh, situation. So that's what we're trying to do. And what we're saying is the the benefit that we've put forward, which is applicable for anybody who uh, is sick or quarantined or uh, at home because they need to be at home or or um, you know unable to work, that those people will be able to get the benefit, the two thousand dollars per month for four months, so long as they were earning. $5,000 or more in the year before, and so long as their, their income's uh, gone down to, to nothing as a result of COVID-19. So that's important for everyone to know. There will be businesses, though, that will be impacted by COVID-19, but who will want to continue to be paying their staff. So for those businesses, what we're saying is we will provide them with a wage subsidy so they can continue paying their staff directly, meaning that the the individual uh, won't be getting the emergency response benefit because they'll be being paid by their employer. And we just want to make sure that those employers uh, have an incentive to keep people on if they can see that they can do that, which we think is important. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, the question question is from Molly Thomas with CTV National News. Please go ahead. A vous la parole. Prime Minister Marno, um, uh, the businesses I've been talking to today, you know, they keep saying that the 75 wage subsidy is amazing for them. They're really happy about that. But the Prime Minister kept talking about qualifying businesses. Can you just give us an idea of what exactly these businesses need to be qualified for this? And also, will there be a cap per employee or per business on how much money they can get? Well, thank you. Uh, I think what the, the Prime Minister said this morning, and, and it is important for us to recognize, is that we do have to provide more details on this. We will be working over the course of the weekend to make sure those details are available. Uh, we appreciate it's an urgent and, and important issue for so many businesses. The, the idea is that this is supporting businesses who really, they have been impacted by the uh, COVID-19 crisis, so the revenue has gone down significantly. And they are uh, keeping their employees on, so they're continuing to pay their employees. So that uh, is difficult for a business to do, obviously, if they've been significantly impacted. So the, that's the that's the broad idea that we're trying to uh, address. And you know, I after the prime minister's announcement this morning, I had a number of messages from from business owners, from small business owners, saying, you know, this is something that will help us because we were trying to keep our employees on and continue to pay them, even though we weren't having the same revenue as we had before. So this is intended for those businesses, and it won't be every business, so they can do that. Of course, there'll be many other businesses that, to the extent they can't do that, the good 
part about our, our Canada Emergency Response Benefit is that even if uh, an employee says that we're going to furlough um, uh, an employer, a company decides to furlough their employees, they can maintain that relation with the employee and the employee will get a direct payment from the government. So either way, we're protecting uh, Canadians and uh, recognize that you know people need to be able to have confidence that they'll be able to get access to funds during a challenging time. So no idea right now on a cap. Uh, we will we will give you more details uh, in the in the days to come. Okay. My second question is about you know of course you've announced many emergency initiatives for Canadians that will be helpful. But we haven't heard a lot about the energy sector. You referred to that briefly in your comments. What would you say I guess to people in Alberta or Saskatchewan that were struggling long before this crisis that feel like they are last on the emergency list? They're absolutely not last on the emergency list. Let me just start by saying we recognize that the the impacts for uh, for many people working in the energy sector in Alberta or in Saskatchewan or Newfoundland and Labrador are amplified because they have the issue around the, the COVID-19, which is obviously presenting enormous challenges. But on top of that, they have a very difficult situation because of changes at OPEC between Russia and Saudi Arabia. So we know that these are, are both impacts. Uh, what we're trying to make sure we do for that sector is is support that sector with, with credit that will be guaranteed by the federal government to a certain extent to allow them to bridge through a difficult time, uh, these, especially these small and medium-sized companies. It's, it's really not different from the way we see uh, how we're going to deal with the small and medium-sized uh, business sector, as we talked about today. We need to help people to have credit to get through a difficult time and to find um, advantageous uh, terms for that. By providing guarantees to the banking sector from the federal government, it enables banks to continue lending in, in challenging situations. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, the, the details are being worked out as we speak, so there, uh, there'll be more opportunity to talk about that uh, shortly. Additionally, we're in discussions with uh, a number of airline uh, companies uh, because we know that that sector has been particularly hard hit, and those discussions also are progressing in a way that, uh, that is getting us to have opportunity to announce things in the, in the not-too-distant future. Thank you. Merci. Notre prochaine question, our next question, our next question. from Mélanie Marquis avec La Presse. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Bonjour. Uh, Monsieur Morneau, Good afternoon. Mr. Morneau, uh, in Bill C-13, a provision indicates that the emergency benefit, in fact, does not apply to a worker who has not uh, ceased, stopped working voluntarily. So I need a clear answer, Mr. Morneau, because readers are asking us very specific questions. For example, if a nurse decides to leave her job because she doesn't feel comfortable working, or a cashier working in a pharmacy decides to voluntarily leave their employment, will they st also be eligible for the $2,000 per month? Thank you. I know it's very important to be clear. There are really two very important conditions. If someone earned over $5,000 over the past 12 months, and if someone is in a situation in which they have no other source of income at this time. So that means that if the person is ill, if the person is quarantined, if that person's employer is unable to pay them a salary, these are conditions. There doesn't have to be a separation between the employee-employer. It means that those who find themselves in a situation in which they're unable to work because of COVID-19 are in, a are in a situation in which they can receive this benefit. All right. Well, I don't quite understand. Let's say a cashier working in a pharmacy in which many people who are potentially affected are, are, are entering. That person may not wish to continue to work because she fears for her own health and safety. If she resigns, can she still receive this benefit? 
What I'm saying is that we must assure people that if they ca cannot work, if they don't feel comfortable in their work, if they decide to stay home, they can apply for the benefit. The two important conditions are whether or not they earned $5,000 over the past 12 months and if they find themselves in a situation in which they cannot earn income right now because of COVID-19. Okay. So, from what I understand, the answer is yes. On another subject, Mr. Trudeau was saying yesterday that you are negotiating with major banks to encourage them to review their interest rates, which are usually 19, 20 percent for credit cards. What are the banks telling you on that subject, Mr. Morneau? To be very clear, I was I've been negotiating with banks over the past week, and an important thing is to find a way for people to have access to credit in order to improve their situation vis-à-vis -vis their loans, meaning mortgage loans, auto loans. So I don't have anything to say on that today, but our discussions continue in order to ensure that everyone can have an improved situation. Also, I have also discussed with the banks who assured me that if someone find them, finds themselves in difficulty, that they may miss a monthly credit card payment or a car loan, for example. So there are programs already with the banks to do so, and those are already in place. Thank you. So we'll come back to the room. There you go. Go ahead, please. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning. And a question for Mr. Polos. Um, so. I'm just wondering if you, if you think fewer people are going to um, apply for the uh, emergency benefit now that you've got that wage subsidy in place. That's my number one question. And then in terms of talking to the banks, what are you asking them to drop their rates to? And are they listening? Are they going to do something? And then I have a question for Mr. Polk, Governor Polk. So that was a tricky way to get more than two questions in. Is that, is that the idea? The... Um, our, our, our sense is that for, uh, for a large number of organizations that are facing a significant drop in revenue, they, they will furlough their employees, and those employees will get a direct payment from the government. It'll be $2,000 per month for up to four months. Uh, we do know, though, that there are, there are many employers out there who, notwithstanding that they've had a significant drop in their revenues, would like to, to keep all of their employees on and keep paying their employees in full. That is, that is a, a subset of, of employers. I can't tell you I know exactly how large either subset uh, is, but I expect that, uh, that there will be firms that will avail themselves of that opportunity. We wanted to make sure that was there for them. Uh, and that, that, I think, is, is important. But primarily what we're saying to Canadians is whether you're in the first category or the second category, we have your back during a difficult time. And that's, that's critically important. With respect to our discussions with banks, uh, I think what, what we're trying to say is, is uh, not that we're negotiating on particular rates. The banks will continue to act in a commercial way that's appropriate. But what we're trying to make sure is that, that individuals, that small businesses have access to credit. And of course, having access to credit is a way for people to uh, lower their overall costs in their, in their family because if they have access to low-cost credit. The example I would give you is the, uh, the approach we've taken today announced that uh, small businesses can get access to $40,000 of, of interest-free uh, debt, so interest-free loans from the bank. So it really means for a small business, they can, they can now get that $40,000, they can main, make their way through a challenging time, and if they pay back that amount by the, the end of the, the first part of the term, by December 31st, 2022, they will have up to 
25% of the loan forgiven. So if it's a $40,000 loan, they'll have $10,000 forgiven. So a, a very good position for them because, of course, we don't want businesses to be saddled with debt at the end of this, and that will help them to get through a tough time. Uh, in, in terms of the uh, head of the Fed, Jerome Powell said, um, I think it was yesterday, that uh, the country may well be in a recession, but it's different than your usual recession because the economy is actually sound. Is that how you see what's going on in Canada? And on quantitative easing, is there any limit to how much money you're willing to print? Uh, so I'm I just think, going to break uh, into our coverage here on CBC News Network and CBC.ca with a special message for people watching in Ontario, because at around, uh, not at around, at 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, you will get some emergency alerts sent to both your cell phone, your radio, if, or if you are watching here on television. It will be an alert that looks very much like what you would know to be an amber alert, but this will be a special message from the Ontario government telling travelers that they are required to self-isolate for 14 days because of the pandemic. Uh, the message will also tell you not to visit stores, family or friends. But you can expect that in 10 minutes time on your cell phone, your radio and on your TV screens if you're watching here. Just wanted to give you a warning that that's coming and that's what it is and is an authorized message from the Ontario government that will be sent to everyone here in the province of Ontario. Let's go back now to our press conference with the Governor of the Bank of Canada and the Finance Minister. So I start this story, though, with the Canadian economy before all this happened. We were uh, at a 40-year low in unemployment with inflation on target. The economy was in very good shape, was demonstrating resilience uh, all last year, despite the, the trade wars uh, that were underway. Uh, so we were feeling pretty confident that actually this year with uh, NAFTA and so on, uh, we would have we would have uh, the makings of a, a very sustained uh, output path. Uh, well, okay, now now we don't have that. And so since I can't really comment on how behavior is, is being affected by all this, so how, how consumer uh, confidence and business confidence, what matters there is are the policies buttressing that confidence. And this is what you're seeing. Is those, those are uh, major fiscal efforts uh, to do that. In the meantime, our part is to maintain the flow of credit so the system's working. Uh, so that banks can function in their, their usual way, and indeed, right now, in extraordinary ways, right? Banks are doing things like deferrals of mortgages and so on, which, you know, it's, it's almost like policymaking, isn't it? It's, it's a very helpful uh, aspect. So all that to say, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's relevant. Uh, I mean, uh, how, how, much of a, of a, how much does a output contract is how we would measure... Uh, whether or not we were in a session is almost irrelevant. It's, uh, it's just a number. What matters is what's going under the surface. And if we manage to uh, buffer consumer confidence and business confidence, and I think we will, uh, and if, if the, the policies we talked here, if they work as intended, I think we'll maintain those linkages between companies and their employees. And that means that we'll have a very robust return to where we were. Uh, we will have limited or possibly avoided permanent damage to the economy. That's that's what that's all about. Uh, your other question is about QE. Uh, you posed it in a way which uh, I think is intended to be to, to uh, be a little bit pejorative, perhaps. Uh, so uh, you know, we we as we've said, QE um, QE. Uh, the the short form for QE is you're printing money. Uh, it's true that the central bank balance sheet is increasing. That's exactly how we do print money. But when we think of, uh, of uh, in, when we're first doing our economics classes, we think of printing money as printing money and giving it to people in an envelope, and they, they spend it. So it's out there permanently. And so the old Milton Friedman thing about too much money chasing too few goods, printing money is not a sustainable policy. And that's been proven many times in history. Uh, what we're doing uh, today is we're doing QE in order to accommodate demands for liquidity by all sorts of people, not just market participants, uh, not just by banks, but by companies and individuals. So companies with you know large credit lines with their banks, which are there for a rainy day, are pulling their entire credit line. So they have the cash at hand. 
well, where's the cash go? Well, they're going to put it in the bank. You know, they don't take it out per se, but they know they have even more ready access to it now that they've pulled it down their line. Well, it's going back into the system, but it's being held for precautionary reasons, not in order to go out and, and, and spend it the way you think of as money printing. So I'm, I'm trying to draw an important distinction here. I, I, hope, I hope you appreciate that the demand for liquidity rises. The central bank expands its balance sheet in order to accommodate it. You know, someday the tensions will ease back and we won't need as much liquidity in the markets in order to keep them functioning. But in order to make sure that markets understand that there's uh, that this QE program is there to stay, we've said explicitly today that we will continue to buy Government of Canada debt until such time as we have uh, a recovery in the economy well underway. And we can fuss about those details at a future date. But the main thing is, it's essentially when you ask how big can it be, there's no theoretical limit uh, to this. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that it's that it's too big. You know that the, in fact, the, the fiscal actions are sufficient that you would expect to be a lot of cushioning to what's going on, um, and that's fine. As I said this morning, uh, no firefighter ever got criticized for using too much water. Thank you. Yep. Hi, uh, Rachel Haynes from CTV. Uh, for Minister Morneau, um, today the details that we do have from the wage subsidy plan say that small businesses can access it for three months. But earlier, Dr. New said that this could go on for many months is what we're looking at. So are you willing to extend this program at the current rate of 75 percent for as long as this crisis continues? I think what you're pointing out is uh, is the reality of the situation we find ourselves in. We can't, nobody can really predict the, the depth or the duration of this challenge. You've seen us respond, I would argue, uh, as fast as we can to the challenges that we're facing, to change our approach in a way that protects Canadians. What we're talking about today is making sure we're protecting businesses that want to take the course of, of keeping their employees engaged. And I think we're going to be open to responding to the challenges that we face. So we, we aren't there yet, so I don't need to yet come to that conclusion. But uh, what we've demonstrated is that we do want to address this issue. We absolutely believe it's important to protect Canadians, to make sure they have money for what they need, and to protect businesses so they can come out of this challenge. And if the challenge is longer uh, or deeper, then we'll respond accordingly. the wage subsidy come a bit late because other countries had been implementing it and there had been calls in Canada to implement a 75 percent wage subsidy. More than a million people have already applied for EI. We know that there have been a lot of layoffs. So are businesses now in a tougher situation than they would have been had this measure been previously announced? And could more layoffs have been avoided if this announcement had come sooner? I, 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 I will never be able to know what might have happened if. What I do know is what we've been focused on, though, from day one. We've looked at what's the best way that we can get uh, funds to Canadians who are impacted by this, this really an, Im important challenge. And in our, in our situation, in our economy, we have uh, about 5.7 million people out of the 19 million people who work each day are not employed by an employer. So we were very focused on how do we make sure that everybody gets access to funds. So it meant for the, you know, the person who is a personal support worker who works on their own or, a, or somebody who drives an Uber, uh, it, all these people who aren't necessarily attached to an employer, we needed to figure out how to get money to them and to get money to people who might be, you know, off homesick and to deal with with people who were not getting income because their employer you know said that we can't we can't pay you anymore so we realized this was the most important challenge and you've seen us react quickly uh, that to me was the most important issue that we need to get on really rapidly and it, it was a it was a big challenge because we needed to make sure that we could support all those people we had to look at our systems to make sure we could deliver I'm uh, now uh, each day we're getting uh, more and more detail about exactly when we can deliver. So people, as of the week of April 6th, during that week, will be able to, to go online in a simple way, get access to money through the CRA. Uh, that, we think, is really important. And this just provides another channel. So um, we're going to keep responding appropriately. And 
we won't always get it right. We, 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 this is moving so fast that we won't always get it right, but we will keep working at it to make sure we do get it right and that we do support people and that we deal with challenges that come up tomorrow and the day after and the week after that. Do we have another question in the room? No. Okay, we'll go back to the phone. Moderator, up to you. Thank you. Our next question, notre prochaine question, is from Theresa Wright with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Uh, hello, Mr. Morneau. Um, we've heard uh, evolving spending measures that, that have been announced over the last couple of days. Uh, you say there's more um, support coming for different industries. How much spending overall are you considering? And what are all the, um, all the other measures that are under consideration right now? Well, thank you. Uh, I think the first thing to, to frame my response to your question is we start with a very good fiscal position. So, so knowing that that is a really good starting point means we are fortunate in Canada. We actually have the capacity to deal with this in a way that we need to. So we, we have the capacity to deal with this in the way that we need to. <clears throat> I will tell you that we have not put a cap on what, what we uh, might, might need to invest to solve this problem, to make sure that we protect Canadians. It continues to evolve. So we are going to respond appropriately. The measures that we've put out so far uh, mean that we are, we are putting out 5% of our overall economy or more. Uh, and that's before we start thinking about the, uh, the, the credit that we're putting in place for businesses to get through this time period. So it's, it's very significant. It is uh, entirely possible that we will need to make it be more significant and we're gonna deal with those things uh, as we go along. As for uh, new measures, uh, we, we continue to look at how we can support people to get through this time. So as we have new, uh, new things that we need to introduce, people that are facing challenges, we need to support uh, vulnerable Canadians who might find themselves in a particularly different, uh, difficult situation. Uh, so we're going to be talking more about those things in the days to come, and we'll do it as soon as we have uh, more details for Canadians. I can appreciate that you're saying that there's no cap, but do you, is there a number that you have in mind in terms of right now what what the spe the, the overall spending that, that that the economy can take right now and and what the plan is there? No, there's not a cap. There's there's a, a realization that we need to support Canadians and that we're going to do whatever it takes to support Canadians. There's a realization that we need to come out of this strong, so we need to support businesses so they can actually bridge the gap. Uh, we uh, we're always going to responsibly look at what these programs cost, but that is not the key issue right now. We've got literally millions of people who are worried about whether they're going to have the money to support their families in the, in the coming weeks. That is first priority, and that's, that's where we're going to continue to place our focus. Those businesses that are really the place where people get their jobs, those including not-for-profits where people go to work every day, we want them to bridge this gap. We expect that this will be difficult, but uh, relatively short in term. So we need to find a way to bridge that, and we're not going to put a cap on it. We're going to do whatever it takes to support people. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, that question question, is from Dylan Robertson with the Winnipeg Free Press. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. The Premier of Manitoba has asked for um, emergency um, loans for provinces. And uh, I'm just wondering if you've had that request from any of the provinces uh, and if you're planning to do anything like look into that request. Well, I'll, I'll just thank you for that question. I think that that's a, a question that, that may be well addressed by the governor. I can say from, from my perspective, we are in regular contact with the provinces. I'm uh, holding daily uh, calls with, with, with many of them. Uh, we have a regularly scheduled weekly call. We know that this challenge is placing pressures on provinces. Uh, we know that we need to work together around the health challenges first and foremost and make sure that they're resilient also in the face of this, uh, this issue. So that's our continuing uh, goal. I know the government, governor has uh, likely some things to say about the, uh, about the overall markets. Governor? Well, yes, in uh, 
Thanks, Minister. I mean, of course, uh, if, if there were tensions or stresses, I guess is a better a better word, uh, in the Government of Canada market, there's even bigger stresses in the uh, provincial bond market. Uh, this is totally understandable when liquidity is in short supply. Um, so uh, uh, what we've done is, is last week started a, um, a, a program to purchase uh, provincial uh, securities at, at issue. So we are, we are uh, taking 40% of each short-term uh, short uh, issue from, uh, from provinces. Uh, we're working with the uh, the treasurers uh, across the across the country to, to create predictability along that uh, financing schedule, um, and uh, and so that so that they don't all, all come the same day. We're kind of organizing ourselves so that there's usually one or two in each each trading day, and uh, and so uh, that's that's working well. It's already uh, had an impact on some of the spreads, so we know that uh, people have noticed that we're there. So this should ease those financing constraints uh, for the provinces uh, and uh, and at least give them uh, predictability for their near-term cash flows. I mean, at this stage, uh, we're, we're focusing on short-term uh, paper precisely because we all believe that this is a short-term uh, shock that we're dealing with. The idea is to get us, build us a bridge to normalcy. And uh, although, of course, there's uncertainty how long that would be, uh, we we are all hoping that it's it's uh, it's not very long. You know, uh, say say three months, four months. That would be uh, that would be uh, welcome if it works out that way. And um, and so the financial financing we put in place is meant to has that as a vision. But of course, as I said in, in answer to a previous question, uh, we can ramp up any one of these programs if need be uh, if if the situation takes longer. Or it becomes more severe. And uh, just a, a follow-up for Governor Polos. Uh, I apologize. The, the proposal is for an emergency credit agency, not loans. I misspoke. Uh, the basis of that would be that Ottawa would likely have a cheaper interest rate than some of the provinces. And I'm just wondering if um, purchasing provincial securities is a better option than having something like an emergency credit agency. Well, the the one the, the, the obvious advantage is that we can do it at the drop of a hat, which is what we did. We uh, we announced it a week a week or so, at the beginning of the week, and we did deals this week. Um, and so uh, there's nothing to set up except uh, you know a bit of a stress in our frankly overworked uh, trading uh, uh, operations, which is three groups of people scattered so they don't uh, all become ill uh, together. Um, and uh, they're doing a remarkable job of executing, as I said, we've accumulated over $90 billion in these two weeks already of additional assets on our balance sheet, doing programs that we've never done before for the most part. Uh, so it's uh, quite a tribute to fast acting. So, uh, I mean, that, that, uh, that I think, what, what is happening there is, of course, there's always a modest spread uh, between government of Canada and and provincial interest rates, but interest rates are all low. So uh, I mean, we're not none of this is expensive financing. Everybody's borrowing very inexpensively uh, at this stage. So I don't really think the cost of financing is the issue. It's the availability, uh, given that markets are demanding liquidity. And so we're in there to make sure that the market functions in both directions. And it appears to be, uh, we're off to a good start. I'm not going to declare a victory, of course, because we haven't done something for every province yet. But we'll be keep doing it until until conditions are normalized, as simple as that. And again, the size is whatever market conditions demand. Thank you. We will be taking Thanks. one last question. Thank you. Merci. Our last question is from Micheline Laflamme with Radio-Canada. Please go ahead. Have you the parole. Thank you, Mr. Morneau. I would like to hear your thoughts once again on what all this means, that is this morning's announcement, for small businesses. What that announcement means for employees who we're already laid off, and how this is all going to work. Will they still receive the emergency benefit, or is it now up to their employers to pay them? 
qui vont s'occuper de, de les rémunérer. Et est-ce qu'on on, s'attend prochainement à avoir des mesures aussi pour les moyennes entreprises? Do we expect to see such measures for medium-sized businesses too? You've talked about big companies and small companies, but what about medium-sized businesses? Merci. Thank pour, you. Euh, pour les gens qui sont euh, maintenant euh, dans une situation où ils ne For those who now find themselves in a situation without income because of COVID-19, if something has already been done with their employer, they will have the opportunity to receive the emergency benefit, which will be there for them. Should their employer decide to reconsider their options, there are other ways to go about things meaning that they can, things can happen with the employer. But I think that most of the people who find themselves in such a situation now will have an opportunity for emergency benefits for the month of April. But now employers have a choice, and that's an important thing. We believe that this will make people feel more secure. And with the emergency benefit, they can continue that relationship with the employer and still collect the emergency benefit. Today, we have also announced that it will be easier for small and medium-sized businesses to obtain credit. So we, we are there for big businesses, but what we did at the very beginning was for small and medium-sized businesses, and that is part of this morning's announcement. That is the possibility of a loan up to $40,000 for small and medium-sized businesses, and that's very important because it's a, an interest-free loan, and if the small and medium-sized businesses repay the loan before December 31st, 2022, they will receive a 20, the loan will be forgiven uh, of 25 percent, so that can go up to $10,000. That's a very important way them, for them to be able to be confident that once today's challenges have passed, they can recover their business and continue operations, and that's very important for them, and it's very important for our economy, too. Merci. Et, euh, Thank you. Il y, a, il y a des pays qui ont annoncé euh, une aide. Some countries have announced depuis, uh, help for small businesses uh, for some time uh, now. For, alors, for example, ici, in Denmark. Here, bouge, things are moving, but do you believe en danger, ou en fait, que vous you imperiled, or rather, that you made the situation worse en, for en businesses by delaying this announcement? Je, je sais que, que les, les choses changent vite. I know that things are changing quickly. We decided at the beginning that the most important thing to do was to protect people who will find themselves without income. That's why we created this emergency benefit, an approach that's going to assure all Canadians that they find themselves in difficulty because of COVID-19, whether they have a relationship with an employer or whether they are uh, self-employed or whether they work as freelancers or whether they are Uber drivers, that they will have access to money thanks to our approach and our benefit. That is very important. Otherwise, in two weeks, we will find ourselves in a situation in which people don't have enough money to for food and, med and medicine and so forth. So I think we found a good approach. But now we're going to open up another another approach for other companies. But in the end, the important thing for me was to have an approach that protects people, that protects businesses, and with the emergency benefit and the loans for, uh, now available for small and medium-sized businesses that we are there. Thank you. This ends the press conference.
Okay, and that is our uh, third uh, federal press conference uh, today, bringing us up to date on some of the economic measures this time this government is taking uh, to help Canadians uh, deal with the pandemic. Uh, both the Governor of the Bank of Canada and the Finance Minister, Bill Morneau, they're answering some questions. Let me bring in David Cochran to go through uh, really the significant announcement for people today that they need to sort of start wrapping their heads around uh, the information that they're going to need around the uh, small and medium-sized business wage subsidy. David, I'll just maybe get you to walk us through that in, in, in plain language so everybody can <laughs> yeah. understand, because that was who's, a lot there. <laughs> who's ready for some math? Yeah. Okay, so here's the new stuff that was announced today. Uh, I'll start with a wage subsidy for small and medium-sized businesses. The initial offer from the government, the measure to deal with uh, the struggles of small companies were having was a 10% wage subsidy for up to three months. They're now jacking that up to 75% for up to three months and I think like anything right now that length of time is probably negotiable depending on how long this goes. Uh, this will apply to small and medium sized businesses, it will also apply to nonprofits. If you need more specific information than that you have to wait and stay tuned. That will come on Monday. My sense Rosie is they're going to announce the big number and the big broad intention, field a bunch of questions of what about me and use that to tweak the criteria to make it apply as broadly as possible. If the wage subsidy isn't enough for you as a small business you can now qualify for a $40,000 loan that would be interest free for the next year and if you pay it all back before December of 2022 you get to keep $10,000, so 25% off if you pay it back over a set period of time. This will be run through your regular financial institution and the loan will be completely guaranteed by the Government of Canada so the Canadian government is using its credit rating and its credit line to extend individual loans to small businesses so that they can get extra cash to operate and maybe manage inventory and their supplies and pay rent and pay bills on top of the subsidy to help pay employees. There is a separate uh, series of credit programs through the Export Development Canada and Business Development Canada that can give loans to, I would gather, gather larger companies. Uh, ones that maybe don't have a few employees, they might have a few hundred employees. They need credit that goes beyond $40,000. You can get loans of up to six and a half million dollars that will be backstopped uh, by these agencies, federal agencies, and again, the Government of Canada's credit. So a broadening of credit available for the small and the medium sized companies. Also, if you're a company that owes GST, HST, or has import duties, export duties that you owe the government, they are deferring this until the end of June. So payments that were due in March, April, or May, those are now being punted down the road uh, so that you can hold on to that money and keep that cash and maybe use it to pay the rent bill until things get back to normal or whatever you need to do and start paying that back to the government at the end of June. The total value of the measures outlined today, Rosie, are about $95 billion. This is on top of what was announced and passed in Parliament mm -hmm. this week? Losing yes, track this of time? week, this week, yeah. yes. So it was announced last week, passed this week. You're now north of $200 billion in direct payments, extensions of credit, and deferral of taxes as the economic response from the federal government uh, to the economic challenges posed by COVID-19. That is not an insignificant dollar amount, and it is not even close to being the end. No. Uh, you now have wage subsidies, you have uh, income support for people who do lose their job or lose their income, and you have credit expansion that's available. What is still to come, in addition to any increases or expansions of those measures, are specific, bespoke, tailor-made bailout or assistant packages for the acutely affected sectors such as airlines, tourism, and the energy sector, which is suffering the double whammy of the price war between Saudi Arabia and, and, and Russia that is happening right now and was hammering oil producing provinces even before the pandemic uh, uh, flattened the, the entire uh, economy. So what you have there uh, is the second wave of direct financial aid. And on top of that, Rosie, is Stephen Polos. This is just uh -huh, what Bill uh -huh. Morneau is doing. Uh -huh. Stephen Polos, the governor of the Bank of Canada, cut interest rates again, another half percentage point, another sh surprise rate that's really not a surprise because this is where the world is going, down to 0.25% uh, as its main lending rate, saying that's about as low as we're going to go. And then offering news on other details that they are going to use quantitative easing, which is a way of injecting money into the economy to buy $5 billion worth of Canada bonds a week until the, not just this is over, until the recovery is, is, is taking hold and things mm -hmm. are getting back to normal. So that's a lot of money going into the financial system to keep it afloat. And on top of that, as we talked about earlier in the week, 
they're buying provincial bonds because while the federal government has an excellent balance sheet and can survive this, provinces are a totally different story. They have more fundamental challenges right now, especially oil producing ones. Uh, they weren't able to get buyers when they went to Bond Street to buy their, their debt and their credit and their bonds. So the Bank of Canada is going to buy 40% of their short term bonds to make sure they have the cash they need to make payroll and keep the lights on while all of this is going on. Let me add two little points. First of all, that the governor of the Bank of Canada did say that, you know, they're throwing everything they have at it. And in his evaluation, he thinks it's enough, uh, which I think is is, is noteworthy. And, and then just because we've been getting a lot of questions about it, the issue of credit cards uh, right. and the credit card interest rates, which remain very high. And I understand people are, you know, maybe using credit cards now to make ends meet. Uh, the finance minister saying he continues to negotiate with banks over the past week. So he didn't have anything specific to say on that front today, David. But, but this is an interesting point, Rosie, because we did get that lovely statement from the Canadian Bankers Association mm -hmm. uh, a week or so ago saying they would be there to help Canadians. And we did get the same assurances from Bill Morneau when him and Stephen Polaz and, and the superintendent uh, of financial institutions had their news conference two Fridays ago saying the banks would be helpful and cooperative. There's a lot of anecdotal stories and individual people coming out saying yep. my bank isn't being so helpful, my bank yep. isn't being so cooperative. Um, the federal government to this point has been asking the banks to help. If, if the critical mass of these problems start stacking up too high, it may get to the point where the federal government starts telling the banks uh, what they have to do. Um, because you can't have every instrument of monetary policy from the Bank of Canada and every fiscal instrument from spending capacity from the government of Canada working in one direction. Yep. Many of these measures designed to keep the banks with cash and to keep them running and not have the banks necessarily living up to the spirit and the intent of what Canadian expectations yeah. are in this unprecedented time. The, 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 the goodwill, I think, will evaporate fairly yep. quickly for banks if, if that doesn't change quickly. David Cochran, thank you so much for your coverage you throughout it. this special. We'll see you on The National tonight. Thank, my thanks as well to Vashi Capellas. You can catch her on Power and Politics tonight at 5 Eastern. Let me just leave you with one Challenging thought. Quebec today confirming 10 more deaths overnight. Uh, the the Quebec Premier saying that he knows it's hard. It's hard to digest that. Um, and the numbers are happening in Quebec because their spring break, their travel happened about two weeks before elsewhere in the country. Uh, so I'll leave you with that thought. And one more, that the BC health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, will bring you that information later. But she says there are some hopeful signs in British Columbia. I'll leave you on a positive note as we bring you to Nova Scotia, where officials are providing an update on COVID-19 cases. Uh, my colleague, uh, there are 17 new cases in that province, and I will sign off from here. I'm Rosemary Barton. Jennifer Hall picks up our coverage here on CBC News Network. We'll see you again tomorrow. That is inappropriate. These people are need your support. They need your love and caring. So I'm, I'm imploring everybody that we all need to be at our best here. We need to be kind. We need to be considerate. Be there and be a friend. We are three weeks into this, and I know lots of people are getting tired. I certainly am. We have, but we have a long road ahead. We need to continue to 